show is nearly over. Let's take another quick look at Wednesday's front pages. We have the Daily Mail, victory for the bravest head teacher in Britain. Telegraph, leadership hopefuls defy Sunak over smoking ban. Guardian, Tory divisions exposed a Sunak smoking ban that moves a step closer. The Times, police look at multiple allegations over Rayner. I News, Sunak gives Netanyahu a warning from world leaders. And finally, the Daily Star, Lettuce Liz. Plucky Daily Star Lettuce is part of the evil London elite, she says. Those were your front pages. That's all we have time for. Thank you to my guests, Leo Kirsten, and Steve N. Allen. Cressida Wetton will be here tomorrow at 11 p.m. with Steve and Lewis Schaefer. If you're watching at 5 a.m., stay tuned for breakfast. Otherwise, thank you for your company. Good night. warm feeling inside from boxed boilers sponsors of weather on gb news Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction. And with isobars out and opening out as well, lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland. Parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here 
for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello, good morning, good to see you. Six o'clock Wednesday, 17th of April. You're very welcome to Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster with you all the way until half past nine. Leading the news this morning, Nigel Farage hits out at cancel culture in Brussels after police attempted to shut down the National Conservatism Conference yesterday. The Prime Minister suffered a Tory backlash as key leadership contenders snubbed his smoking ban. Yes, Rishi Sunak sees the smoking shut ban it down. as they a big shut part it down. of his legacy, but 165 of his own MPs didn't vote for it. What does that mean for his leadership? Meghan Markle unveils the first product in her new lifestyle brand, Jam. A pub in St Albans has sparked an online row over its child-free policy, which is our debate this morning. Is it unfair to exclude children from pubs? And just after seven, we'll be uh, expecting the latest inflation figures. Liam Halligan, our uh, finance editor, here to break down what that may mean for you. And sports news. Well, Champions League last night, Paris Saint-Germain came from behind to beat Barcelona. Dortmund did exactly the same thing to Atletico Madrid last night as well. Uh, and as we look for tonight, will Arsenal head to Munich to play and Manchester City will be playing Real Madrid and they're both level. And... It's 100 days until the Olympic Games today. A gusty wind again across the east with a few showers. There will be a bit of rain in the west, particularly for Northern Ireland. But for many, it's going to be a fine and a bright day just on the fresh side. Join me later for all the details. Top story, controversy continues to plague the National Conservative Conservatism Conference in Brussels after attempts were made to shut it down yesterday. Um, the local mayor has called Emir Kerr and he opposed all that was going on, claiming he issued the order to police to ensure public security. Well, Nigel Farage was a keynote speaker at the event and he was on stage as police arrived to try and close it down. The police are outside the door as I speak. They will not let anybody else in. There are three police there. They have an order to close down this event. And when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do, it's the events here in Brussels today. 
Well, the Belgian Prime Minister labelled the moves unacceptable, uh, a sentiment echoed by the British government, who told GB News... It's unclear exactly what's happened here, but the scenes will worry anyone who believes in free speech. Free society should be confident enough to allow free debate. Labour, however, were quick to point to the calibre of attendees. They said Suella Bravman and Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban, a close ally of Putin, were questionable. I think some of the speakers, from what I understand, who have been advertised on the website for this conference have very unsavoury views. I'm rather surprised that Suella Braverman has been allowed to go and speak at this event. Why is Rishi Sunak not getting a grip of this situation? Why is he not asking Suella Braverman to pull out of this event? Because some of the characters involved, at least according to their website, have made all kinds of comments which I don't think the Rishi Sunak's Tory party would want to associate themselves with. Well, the attacks at Suella Braverman didn't stop there. The Shadow Health Secretary was streeting. Uh, this is what he had to say in the Commons yesterday. Right, honourable member for Fareham, who couldn't be here today with us, Mr Deputy Speaker, because she's currently in Brussels, surrounded by uh, the police who are trying to sh shut down the event she's attending with some far-right fanatics um, with whom she has much in common. So there we go. Uh, we're going to now get the thoughts of our political uh, correspondent, Olivia Utley, on all of this. So, Olivia, tell us uh, why the controversy about this, what was so bad about this, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister there, not the, the Prime Minister of, uh, where is it in? Hungary. Be uh, no, no, in Bra Belgium. Belgium. Um, so he's, he's a real far lefty, um, and he was worried about violence. Um, was that likely? Well, the whole conference was beset with problems from the get-go. Uh, two events that were supposed to host it ended up backing out at the last minute because the Belgian mayor, who is the, the, the Brussels mayor, who is a socialist, uh, did not want the event to go ahead. Finally, the organisers found this venue, which were willing to accept them. But then while they were inside, the Belgian mayor ordered the police to close it down. Now, he said that there were... a uh, public order concerns with the event. There are suggestions that perhaps papers he had seen papers which suggested there might be uh, comments which would be homophobic at the event uh, or that there would be people who could be uh, offended by what some of the speakers would say. Lots of us uh, in the West, living in democratic countries, think that that's OK, that people being offended by what other people have to say is, is part and parcel of democracy. But this mayor decided that the event had to be closed down. Then we got into the sort of farcical situation where Nigel Farage was uh, on the stage speaking. The Belgian police turned up. There weren't very many of them and it was a big event. So they went off to get back up. Back up arrived. There was this huge line of Belgian police standing outside this event and delegates were allowed to leave but they weren't allowed to enter. At one point the, Bel the Brussels mayor even said that he would be prepared to shut off the electricity at the event uh, if it were to continue. Continue. Now, on the whole, the reaction to this around the world has been uh, outrage with the mayor for thinking that he had the right to, to close down this event. And there are plenty of Brexiteers who sort of follow what Nigel Farage said yesterday and said that this is a, a, a good reason to leave the European Union. One element of this which I find quite fascinating is in the UK we've had such a controversy over the European Court of Human Rights. But there is an argument, lawyers have been suggesting, that some of the Conservative MPs who were there, for example Suella Braverman, who had to uh, stop speaking because of the police turning up, she could potentially sue the Brussels mayor under the rules of the European Court of Human Rights, the organisation which she has been so keen for Britain to leave. So there's all sorts of interesting uh, elements playing out in this saga here and it'll be fascinating to see what happens at the event today. Olivia, um, let, let's talk about uh, matters yesterday in, in the Commons and uh, backers of Rishi Sunak's smoking bill, um, there's been a bit of a rebellion there. How, how serious is this Tory civil war? 
Well, it's a pretty big rebellion. There were 165 Conservative MPs who voted against this bill, which, let's remember, Rishi Sunak wants to be considered a, a big part of his legacy. Five of those MPs who rebelled were Cabinet Ministers, including some uh, hopefuls for the Tory leadership. Kemi Badenoch, for example, voted against the bill, and so did uh, Suella Braverman and Robert Jenrick, former Cabinet Ministers, who people are very much eyeing up for the prospect of leadership. The fact that Rishi Sunak decided to make it a free vote, meaning that MPs weren't whipped into voting with him, that means that anyone who rebelled from the government side won't be disciplined, so it doesn't actually count as a, 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 an actual uh, technical rebellion, as it were. But... It's not a great sign for Rishi Sunak's leadership. It's very embarrassing for a prime minister when he's only able to get through big flagship legislation because of votes from the opposition. And that is exactly what happened last night. Lots of Labour MPs voted with the prime minister. So the legislation got over the line uh, pretty easily. But it does speak to a bit of dissatisfaction with the direction that Rishi Sunak is going in from the Tory backbenches. And I think a lot depends on what happens in those May local elections. If Rishi Sunak does really, really badly, then I think we could be looking at a, position, at a situation where letters of no confidence are going in and potentially there could be a leadership election before the general. Gosh. Thanks, Olivia. Um, Sir Jake Berry, one of the Conservative MPs to vote against this bill, he spoke to GB News after the vote last night. We live in a country where the government tells you what car to buy, what central heating you can have in your phone, looks to arrest you for misgendering people. I believe in freedom. And if you are free as a nation, you, it's freedom to make good choices as well as bad choices. This is slipping towards a sort of social democratic, socialist country. Frankly, if all freedom means to you is you have the freedom to do what the government tells you you can do, you may as well move to Russia or China. Mm. In other news this morning, um, the Prime Minister has told his Israeli counterpart that now is a moment for calm heads as Israel's considering its response to Iran's missile and drone attacks over the weekend. Rishi Sunak spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu on a call that was delayed for 24 hours expressing his solidarity but uh, his wishes to further ex escalation. The Rwanda plan has been dealt a series of defeats in the Lords, further delaying passage of the bill through Parliament. Despite MPs in the Commons overturning previous changes by the Lords, peers again pressed demands for revisions to the bill specifically around human rights. The airline EasyJet has suspended flights to Tel Aviv for the next six months following more uncertainty uh, over the Israeli situation. Flights will be halted until the 27th of October uh, if you have booked you will be offered a full refund. Uh, now, take a look at these pictures. If you are in uh, the car or listening on the radio, worth checking them out when you get a moment, because torrential rain and flooding hit Dubai yesterday. Um, the city's authorities had to urge people uh, to stay home. Uh, cars and streets were swamped in water, and Dubai Airport said operations were temporarily diverted, though they have since restarted. It was a year's worth of rain uh, in one day, and obviously this is a desert city, so not really built for this kind of weather. That Dubai situation mm. is absolutely incredible. You've been to Dubai? I have, yeah. Um, well, it's flat for a start, mm -hmm. and um, there's just there's no rain, very, very mm. little rain. And there's a lot a, of road and tarmac. A year's uh, downfall in, in one day, absolutely mm. frightening. Where would you go? Good job mm. with so many skyscrapers, you can climb up. Oh. Yes, um, that's true. That. But a lot of British people holiday there. Um, perhaps you were one of those uh, caught up in all of it. Maybe you have managed to fly home since. And let us know if you have been involved, because it is a popular hotspot uh, for British tourists, and I'm sure some well, of you out there for British were there workers yesterday. as well. So yeah. many people work there as teachers and in the IT industry and advertising various things. Um, so maybe you're watching us from Dubai today. Uh, get in touch, and here's how you do get in touch. You can. Uh, 
email us um, by gbnews.com forward slash your say. Um, Are you ever remember that? It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. GBnews.com forward slash your say. So let us know if you've got pictures, you've got video mm. as well. Uh, please do send them to, to us and we will. You know, we might that. even get you on air if you've got a good story to tell us. We could have a chat with you on the phone or video yeah. call. Uh, Meghan Markle. Uh, right, so there's no slowing down of her taking over the world and Meghan Markle. Oh gosh, OK, she... so she's launched her new product and we've all been waiting for it. So what is it? This, this world takeover? It must, be, it must be incredible. It's what? Jam. Strawberry As in jam. Women's Institute. Strawberry, strawberry jam. Strawberry jam. I, I like a bit of yeah. strawberry jam, but why do you associate <laughs> Meghan Markle with strawberry jam? Anyway, uh. Uh, let's go to Kinsey Schofield and find out she will tell us. Uh, well, how was, it, how was it launched? How do you launch jam? Yeah, so the way that Megan, I guess it could be considered a, a quiet um, launch. Tom, I she, can't sent hear. 50, uh, she sent 50 uh, jars of jam to some of her influencer friends, uh, you know, like the, the wife of the CEO of Paramount and some of her celebrity friends. Um, you know, if you would have told me, because we have been friends for a long time, if you would have told me two years ago, in the midst of us debating whether or not Meghan Markle was going to run for president one day, that we would be having a conversation about her big launch of jam, I would have called you a liar and I would have told you to take the day off. I, I mean, I really can't believe we're having this conversation, but American Riviera Orchard, the the first product that we know of is going to be jam made by Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. Yes. Hmm. What is she trying to be? I mean, is she going to run in politics? Is she trying to be royalty? Um, you know, is she trying to be this, obviously, this uh, Martha Stewart um, type character now where she's supposed to be relating to ordinary housewives in the USA and say, look, you know, here is, here is my jam. This is what I'm all about. I just find it hard to formulate an obvious connection with this Kinsey. Yes, sir. I believe she's trying to build an empire. I don't I know if that hear. was what she was going originally to do when she left the British royal family. Remember, they told us that she was going to be living a life of service. Um, so I don't know if this and, and she has polling wise has been very difficult for the the um, Duke and Duchess of Sussex. People in the states have an issue with them. Uh, so is this kind of um is this did they have to go down this path basically using netflix to create content to kind of try to build this empire of gardening and and what's going on in the kitchen um but also giving netflix ultimately what they want which is that reality show element uh, that was their only commercial success with the harry and megan docuseries so this is her dipping her toe still in reality tv but also having cameras in her face and being able to push her own products but the irony is i mean you used the word reality there a couple of times there's nothing real about this woman at all I mean, I think she's probably really disappointed in what's happened over the last few years. That's that's a reality for her. And what's so sad about looking at everything that's happened within the British royal family uh, since the beginning of 2024 mm. is that had Harry and Meghan truly been uh, compassionate, had they been patient, uh, uh, they could have saved the day in 2024. They would have been elevated in the positions that they felt entitled to throughout their relationship while they were working members of the, of the British royal family, um, because they would have been able to step up to the plate and take on work for the Princess of Wales and King Charles. But unfortunately, instead of doing that, Megan is selling jam. I mean, I'm as surprised as you are, Kinsey, that jam is the thing she's decided to launch this whole new lifestyle brand with. I was expecting something a bit more whizzy. I mean, goodness knows what this is going to retail at, probably something unaffordable. But I suppose looking for the positive in all of this, maybe they've learned the lesson. Maybe they've decided this is how we're going to make a, a living now. We're not going to whinge. We're not going to be rude about our relations. Our sister-in-law is seriously unwell. We're going to sell jam. I mean, maybe this is, maybe they've grown up. I think that that's a great way to look at it. I also think that Megan 
knows that she was good at what she did before she married Prince Harry uh, in that influencer space, in that blogging space. And this is, you know, kind of reverting to back to that. She is going to in, inspire people to purchase things and people are going to watch what she's wearing and watch what she's doing in the kitchen and garden and they're going to try to emulate it. And that is kind of what she was doing before she married Harry. So it's a no brainer. How much it's selling for? Did you get to taste any? You know, I wasn't one of the exclusive 50. I'll try to wait to, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get my hands on some when it went. But how bizarre to do this quiet launch. And still, if you go to AmericanRivieraOrchard.com, I can't buy it. You can't buy it. There's not product available. So all these little PR blitzes, what's the objective when yeah. somebody can't put their credit card in? Yeah. I read somewhere they're trying to emulate a really fancy honey out there that re retails at $280 <laughs> a pot and that they're deliberately producing a really small number of these jams to increase demand, you know, making it really exclusive. Um, who knows? Maybe that's why we didn't get, get the memo, Kinsey. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Lovely to see you, as always. Lovely talking to you. Thank you, Kinsey Schofield. Thank you very much thank indeed. Um, well, the weather situation we were talking about yesterday, it just got worse and worse. It was off, it was on, it was windy, it was rainy, it there was There was sunny. hail bouncing off the lawn. It looked like yeah. popcorn in the microwave yesterday, just pinging off the grass. Yeah. Um, crazy weather, but I suppose April, April showers, that's what you're supposed to get. It's all okay. normal. Well, we're certainly getting those. Let's go to Alex Deacon for an update. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures, pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, a, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland. Uh, increasingly blustery here as well, but further south the winds will be light. Yes, it'll cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine we should again get up to 13 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. How good would it be to escape all of this wild weather and head off to the sunshine? Here's your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies and a £10,000 tax-free cash bank balance boost. And here's how you could do it. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Uh, we're going to run through uh, the last night's football results and look ahead to Champions League matches tonight with Paul Coit right after this break. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. 
I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning to Paul Coit. Uh, the football results last night in Champions League, and we look ahead to some more tonight. And some there's a bit of promotion guaranteed. Last oh, there's, night. yeah, there's loads of stuff that's gone on football. Paris Saint Germain beat Barcelona yesterday, so Barcelona. I, yeah, it was a great game actually. So Barcelona, who were um, three two up going in, going back to Spain. So you're thinking, you know, this is going to be very good for Barcelona against Paris Saint Germain, who obviously extremely rich, have Kylian Mbappe playing for them, but never seem to do what they need to do as a club, and that's win the Champions League. So anyway, Rafinha, who used to play for Leeds, scores for. Barcelona puts them four to up at aggregate. Then the game turns when Ronald Araujo is sent off after 29 minutes. Then the game turns because he's a defender. Then Kylian Mbappe comes into his own. And then so they end up winning. And um, so it's a very good result for Paris Saint-Germain. Coming back, two goals for Kylian Mbappe. And in the other game, a Borussia Dortmund who were also losing... Uh, to Atletico Madrid, and this went to Germany, and the fact that they turned things around as well, and they uh, and they won 4-2. So they're both semi-finalists. They will they? play each other. So it's Paris Saint-Germain against Borussia Dortmund. Yeah. And the fact that Dortmund are now in the semi-final is also bad for English teams trying to qualify for the Champions League because it's that coefficient thing of whoever... Whatever you what, say. What, whatever you as say. soon as I say the word coefficient, your yeah, eyes glaze go on, over. Gone, gone, gone. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. basically means if there's a fifth place, could be available to an English team in the Champions yeah. League. It's, come on, let me explain. <laughs> let me, you know I love a coefficient. Uh -huh. Well, I tell you, no coefficients for Portsmouth. Uh, they came from behind to beat Barnsley last night, 3-2. Yep. Promotion now to the Championship, guaranteed for them. Pompey are up. Last time they were in, the Championship was when? How long ago? Well, Harry Redknapp was the manager, wasn't he? Mm, yeah, we're looking at the, actually the Premier, but a little bit down oh, the sorry, Championship. In the, in the Championship? Oh, no idea. 2012. It's been a long time. Uh. So Pompey, yeah, so they're looking good. Oh. And also down on the south coast, I'll tell you another team that did well yesterday was Southampton. Yes. Because Southampton had a little bit of a wobbly run, but now are looking very good, and it's those places to go up to the Premier League. Uh, and the way things are looking at the moment, they beat Preston 3-0, so Ipswich are on 89, Leicester on 88, Leeds on 87, Southampton on 84. So it's obviously the first two will be promoted into the Premier League and then the other four will then go into the playoffs. Yeah, so yeah. it's really tight. But the Championship is always very exciting. Not mm. many people mention it enough, but it's really exciting. Now, Three games to go. We were getting excited because earlier you were saying it's 100 days today until the start of the Parisian Olympics. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So you know what they did? What they, they do? I love, the, the, I love a ceremony. I love the bit of pomp and circumstance. You know, I love the Olympics. Yeah. So 
over in Olympia. Let's have a look at this. Oh, they know how this to do This is it, what it's all they? about. Yeah. This is the, the lighting of the flame. Now, the flame is usually done... Fr it's the heat from the sun through a magnifying glass, but it was a bit too cloudy. <laughs> so I don't know whether someone used a Bic lighter to light it <laughs> behind the scenes. Now, this is, this is an actress here. She's a very famous... Um, actress from, from Greece who's lighting the flame and then she passes it on. Oh, oh, by the way, her name, I can tell you what her name is if I can find it in just a second. Stephanos Unsuskus is the man she's handing it to. And I know you took a lot of time preparing to say that because you spoke to our Greek makeup artist this morning for pronunciation. Please don't give away my so secret to this I just want to give everyone some appreciation Stephanos, of your hard work Unsuskus, <laughs> Olympic rowing champion, and he will now take that. And then a bird, you're going to have a dove. I don't, does the dove come back again? I don't know. So there he is holding... He's, oh, he doesn't look like a runner, though, does he? <laughs> doesn't run like a runner. No. Maybe if he What's rowed his job? it... Sorry? Rowing. He was a yeah. rower. Yeah, he doesn't look oh, like right, a runner. Yeah. So then passing the flame on, and the flame will travel now across Greece, and then it will go across the Mediterranean on a ship through mainland France. Then they take the, the flame off to all the overseas territories of France. But, do you know, they have to keep the flame alight. So when they go on a plane, they have these, these little lanterns. They'll have three of them, so they like the lantern. I mean, is it safe to take an open flame on it's a plane? It's done every four years, Paul. I was in Cornwall, down in Penzance, when the Olympic flame arrived in the UK ahead of the 2012 Olympics. Right. And then it does the exact same thing. It did a little journey around the whole I'm of the country. I'm just about the aeroplanes. No, they've done it before. I know, but they keep that. So they usually have, like, a fire warden sitting next to this flame, so they just have to guard the flame and then light the flame. See, it, the whole idea is that it's still the same flame yeah. that came I from think it's Greece... Beautiful. That is lit, but I think it was the Montreal Olympics in '76. Do you remember there was the? They have the, the great big thing where it's or the big thing where it's all lit up, and it went out, and you see this guy sort of looking round like I that. I remember going, that. <laughs> Nobody We've knows all been there. Birthday so nice. parties and the similar. Exactly. Yeah, I got a like chance <laughs> to um, hold the flame, hold the torch in the uh, Sydney Olympics. Did you? Yeah. Why? I don't know, because we were filming there for TV, we were going to live right. broadcast back to Britain, and yeah. then I was handed the, the torch, and then I went a few yards with it and handed it to somebody were else. Were you in shorts and singlet? Mm. <laughs> and, and running along? I used to be a good runner. I know you did. I, I know, we often do bring Cross that. country was... Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. Stuff, yeah. But, but I, love, I love the Olympic stuff. I just love, I love the whole yeah. thing around it. See, there's... But you know about the, the arguments about money? I don't think money should be anywhere near the Olympics. And Do I don't know not... why they're doing this. And well, it this doesn't is... seem to be across the board properly either. No. Well, this is the problem. The thing is, doing it, fine, right, whatever. Mm. Mm. Not having it across the board, yeah. like for instance, so uh, uh, runners will get it, but swimmers won't yeah, get well, it. Why? Won't. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and yesterday we had the story they're letting a drugs cheat into Team GB. Now they're bringing money into the Olympics. I don't know if it's really in the I Olympic think when it comes spirit. To money, I think I think the Olympic spirit things have to move on because if we think of what Olympics were like in the old days, people had jobs and then they would just go and do the and and, and it was all about the Olympic spirit and it was amateur. Sport is professional these days, so I just think even if it's fifty thousand pounds for a gold medal. All the work that goes into it's not a lot of money, is it? Really, in yeah. the grand scheme of things, yeah, when but you look what if at you're a swimmer, sports. you get nothing there. And if so... you're a swimmer, you do it for the love. And you've, you've got swimmers and now. And if you're second place or third place, mm. you don't get any money. But also, you know, when you think of the physiques of the swimmers, I mean, it's one of my favourite parts. The Olympics is is admiring of both genders. Well, the physiques of the swimmers. I they are because I have a very similar to, uh, <laughs> a physique to swimmers, but so I are, understand that entirely. Know, why would they be any lesser than than the athletes on the track? There's I can't no understand. There's it. no reason. Well, the the actual argument is the fact that that's what everybody wants to see, is the athletics, the track and field. That's what everybody's involved in. But surely the does whole that, Olympics... Does that include our discus throwing? Our discus throwing. See, that's, yeah, it does include discus, because yeah. discus is still a part of track and field. But yeah. there, would you say discus is more important no. than 200 um, metre freestyle? No. I would say not. So there's the argument. There is the argument. It's horrible. You don't be arguing about problem, money when Paulie. it comes to the Olympics. It's all about the sport, but unfortunately money will be involved and the f more sport goes on, it's a professional business, so mm. it has to be spoken about. OK, Paul, Alrighty. thanks very much indeed. Paul's going to be back again about 20 past I'm an amateur, seven. by the way. Do you you're know what? that? I'm an amateur when <laughs> You're not. You're a pro. You're a coefficient. I'm a coefficient <laughs> amateur. That's what I am. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thank you very much indeed. Still to come, we're going to be going through the front pages, the biggest stories of the day. Uh, Leon Emirali, Scarlett Maguire, after this.
latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M1 in Leicestershire. There's a lane closed northbound where there's an accident between junctions 21A and 22 from the A46 north of Leicester to Ashby de la Zouche, causing delays. Train services are suspended between Ipswich and Stowe Market because of overhead line problems caused by a fallen tree that damaged the lines. In Merthyr Tidville, the A465 is closed eastbound from the Dulles Top Roundabout to Thetcrid because of animals on the road. The A48M in Newport is closed southbound from junction 21 29 of the M4 to St Melons after an accident. In Cardiff, the A48's closed westbound from Culverhouse Cross to the Downs after an accident. And on the M4 in Berkshire, there's a lane closed to eastbound where a lorry's broken down between junctions 14 and 13 from Hungerford to Newbury Course and Kews. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Well, right now and for the uh, the next, I don't know how long we get. But Quite we'll a try lot. Give us, good, do, solid do 6.33. That's good. And there's yeah. no boring government minister. And I a think little bit later on, Eamon, don't worry about right, that. OK. Um, anyway, we've got Scarlett Maguire and we've got Leon Emerali. Thank you both very, very much indeed. Scarlett, I would love to start talking about smacking and smacking children, um, which, are, which is illegal in Scotland. It is illegal in Wales, but it is legal in England and Northern Ireland. And, you know, if you'd asked me this 20 years ago, I'd have thought, oh, you're smacking kids, so what? That's what they deserve, most of them. Um, but now, I just don't think, I just think it's on anymore. I'm with you, actually, completely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, George Bernard Shaw said, you know, the only excuse for smacking a child is in anger. I mean, and, and smacking children on purpose mm. is... And, and it leads to other things. Now, look, I'm no saint. I mean, I have hit a child in a supermarket. I've done, I've done the classic. But, but I've never forgotten that when my partner... Um, our daughter was about two and she ripped a, the cover of a book and he said, don't do it. So, of course, she did it some more. And he took her hand and he gave her a tap. Mm. And she came up to me and she said, Dada, Dada. And she went back and whapped him round the face. She was never hit again. Mm. I mean, it just, it was, it, it was crazy. And I think, I mean, I, I do think that smacking, you know, you begin with smacking and it leads to Does other it? things. Come on. And actually, most children, I mean, you know, it's about having proper authority and you tell them what to yeah, do. Yeah, I don't know. I, do. I'm in the thick of child rearing at the moment. I've got two spirited children. I love more than life itself. I would do anything for them. I'd take their pain away. I'd give them my organs. But would you smack but them? every now and then, they need a little short, sharp smack. With pure love, purely, well, and it might just be on the thigh or on the yeah. hand. I'm never talking about round the face or hitting them. A little short, sharp smack, and that might be controversial. Well, but my, I, I my think father... for, the, for the state to legislate whether or not a parent who loves and cares for their child is able to do that, I think, is, mm. is overreach personally. Well, my father used to. There were five boys in our house. My father used to just walk up and smack us across the back of the head, and you go, "Ow! What was that for?" And he said. Nothing. Wait till you do something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I he, really like your dad, the sound say. of your dad. That's a bit much, isn't it, yeah. I think? But <laughs> Isabel's got a point, because if you're a parent, you should have the right to raise your child in the way in which you mm. choose, but... I think if it gets to the point where smacking verges on violence, i.e. it hurts the child, as you say, Isabel, you know, sort of smack just to say, oi, that's out of order, mm. stop that, <laughs> fine. Um, but I, I was surprised that actually it is legal in the UK, in, in England still. Mm. I was surprised at that, because it does seem very archaic, very old-fashioned. Mm. I'm 
uh, just about to become a dad. Are you? In, Congratulations. Thank you. In August, my wife is due. So thinking about how to raise a child, yeah. I don't think smacking is going to form part of it. Yeah. Though. Good. Fair enough. But Good. it seems, yeah. uh, when you look at the English situation and the Northern Irish situation, they seem a bit uh, prehistoric, don't they, the, uh, compared to Scotland and Wales. Um, yeah. One would have thought mm. that this is going to get through. This is going well, to how through. are they going to legislate it anyway, though? Um, well, genuinely, but, but it is legislated in yeah. Scotland and no, but, I mean, Wales. Are, are people going to report their partner? Well, my just, husband just, just gave my child I a slap on the wrist. I think it gently dies down. The I think people yeah. just don't do it and they it's think it, they realise it's not acceptable. Your views, your very, very welcome. <laughs> Let us know me. what you think. <laughs> um, right, Leon, bravest head teacher, and she, um, you know, there's a lot of talking about not banning this, not banning that, but she wants to ban prayer in her school. Correct. <laughs> so this was a, a fairly expensive um, legal battle, which was a student, Muslim student, who wanted to pray uh, uh, as, as is part of the, uh, of the Islamic tradition, of the Islamic religion. And the head teacher said, no, you can't do that in this school because it isn't a religious school, it's a secular school. And she won. She came out on top in this um, court ruling. So I think she's got a point, again, that actually you sign up to a secular school, you are not there to practice religion, you are there to learn in the classroom. Um, and this school that she runs, Catherine Burble Singh, is incredibly overperforming, and partly because I think she is so strict. She, ha she has such I mean, high standards. So strict. Nobody's allowed to talk or laugh mm -hmm. in the corridors between classrooms. They're never allowed to congregate in groups larger than four. Mm. Um, and they're not allowed to group in, in what's seen as cliques. I mean, uh, do we think that in a world where we're talking about liberty and freedom of speech, Scarlett, that this is modern yeah, teaching? I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want my child going to that school. And, and I was listening to a Muslim parent who, whose child goes to another school uh, where, where praying is allowed um, and it is also a secular school and it also is a nearby school where it also has really, really good results. So I, I don't think you have, to, you have to do that to get good results. I mean, I, I think this thing about secular schools is quite important because when my kids were at school, um, it, it was a secular school, but, but Ofsted told them off because they didn't have Christian assemblies and you think come on you know we we send our children to this school so that yes they will learn about religion i mean that's what the school did is they is they brought in an early gcse in religious studies so that the children actually learned something um but i i mean i, I think quite often <coughs> that they'll go because this is was about <coughs> this was about uh, muslim praying um that they'll go no to the Muslims, and then it will go on with Christians. Mm. And, and I hope that it's a secular school completely. OK, so the future should be set a bit more like the French model, where I there's no religion fair. allowed in the classroom. Yeah, that's fair, because oftentimes, you know, religion <coughs> can be quite overpowering, quite overbearing, and I think that's fine if that's the way you choose to live your life. Mm. As a young person, you shouldn't necessarily be stifled, mm. uh, and, and I think it's right that they, the schools clamp down on this to say, actually, this isn't the place for it. Mm -hmm. Well, except... I just think fabric and standing and morals and lots of, I would like to think, the good things that are in me were, were put there by going to a religious school. And, you know, it's great. I got all that training and whatever at school mm -hmm. and I can choose to use it or not use it then as I, as I progress through life. I think I just somehow look back and I think... It's it's a bit of a weird. But I think but even you your parents yeah. chose to yeah. send you, and, and we're talking. Choice to Northern Ireland. Well, well, all I was going to say we're all schools are religious. We're, but and, also, and we're Scarlett, talking. Northern sorry, you, but you talk as if parents get to pick whichever school they want. You apply to the council, mm. and you, you get lucky based on your top three applications. And it, it's certainly not you choose this school, and therefore you have chosen a secular school. Well, well, but you can. You, I mean, a lot of people choose religious schools. I mean, Northern Ireland is different. One can say that they're very divisive religious schools in Northern Ireland. But you choose a religious school. I mean, I was talking to somebody who who went to the christening of their goddaughter so their goddaughter, who at the time was nine months, would get into a Catholic school. Mm, I yes, mean, that, 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 that happens that, a lot. That, 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 it's not about for religious schools. It's not about the council. Mm. It's it's you know you're supposed to have have mm. uh, gone to church, be baptized, all that mm. stuff. It, it, the, the, the the fact being that they would have chosen to go to that school, they would have chosen to go to that religious uh, ceremony. 
because they believe that religion gives the children in that school more identity, more uniformity, more um, a better upbringing mm, than, mm. than a school which is non-religious. Yeah, I, I went to a, to a Church of England lower school and uh, I actually think it probably made me more atheist as I really? uh, later in life because I saw it and just thought it's not for me yeah. as, at a very young age. And so in a way, if, it, if it's sort of rammed down your throat, you can rebel from it a little bit. Um, so maybe it has the opposite effect in some cases, mm. but... Uh, I, I just... yeah, actually, I, it was just like, I, 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 we lived in the States when I was young, and I went to an American school where I had to um, pledge to the yes. flag every morning. I'm slightly anti-American because <laughs> I was so angry having to do mm. that every morning. Mm. And also keeping on learning about history and why they were right to revolt, which often I, at eight years old, had to stand up and explain why the Americans <laughs> were right and the British were wrong. Never quite forgiven it. No. <laughs> mm. yeah. um, OK, the yeah. smoking <clears throat> ban situation. Why is this, Scarlett, such a... Um, a divisive thing within the Conservative uh, Party. I mean, Isabel and I were talking about this earlier, and it was just that um, what is there to object to making kids addicts uh, mm. by, by taking something that is going to kill them? Well, yeah, I mean, it's about freedom, isn't it? And it's, it's the Conservatives think that you have a right to kill yourself if that's what you want to do. I mean, what, what's interesting is that most smokers wish they'd never started. Yep. And as Chris Whitty says, the, you know, all the arguments against it are put up by the tobacco companies mm. that just make money out of, out of people's addictions. I, I mean, you know... It's it's so it's not just lung cancer. It's it's bronchitis. It's it's all those things, and even you know even breast cancer actually. But I mean anything to do with your lungs. I mean smoking is terrible. Yeah. She says as somebody who used to smoke has been there. Leon, well, is look, this about ideology and politics rather than about you know health? Exactly that, Isabel. It's one of those rare points in politics where ideology just doesn't meet the cold reality of what the country are thinking and what people are thinking and what makes sense. I saw Robert Jenrick yeah. tweeted saying that we should educate and not ban. And I think normally that's a fair approach, but when it comes to addiction, you can't educate your way out of addiction. And I think that's why the government knows entirely smoking is bad for you, so it has a duty, I think, to, to impose this, and I'm glad that they've, that they've so actually passed. So what's he up to, then? Because he's supposed to be a close former ally of Rishi Sunak, and it's not just him. We've got uh, Kemi Badnock, who's in the yeah. Cabinet, coming out saying she can't vote for something that will mean some people have liberties and other people don't. It's not equitable. Mm. You've got um, Penny Mordaunt, who mm. abstained. Is it perhaps about leadership of the Conservatives? Doesn't, it, doesn't, doesn't <laughs> it feel as though those names are all being mentioned as potential leaders mm. post-election? I think it's exactly that. It's positioning yourself with the right of the Tory party, who are probably more right-wing than the average person, so they want to protect those liberties and freedoms and all those things that make us great. I agree with them on most points, but on, on things like addiction, it just doesn't make sense. And actually, I think people like Penny Mordaunt, who's a moderate, mm. I think it's obvious what she's doing, and I think it's actually quite cynical. Yeah, because, mm. I mean, two out of three people in Britain agree with it. Mm. I mean, popular yeah. policy. you know, it's very, very popular policy. Mm. And it's a terrible littering thing around the country as well. People don't even see that. Mm. Stubs, they don't degenerate. They just, you know, people smoke, they throw their stub on the ground, then it's lying there forever. Mm. And, well, and also, for those of of us who, who remember what it was like before they brought in the smoking ban in inside. I mean, can you remember how awful the pubs were? Mm. That you would walk into a pub and you'd walk out just stinking yeah. of smoke yeah, and offices. But that's only retrospectively. You look at that at the time. You just assume... I mean, I used to work in a bar and night after night, of course, you had to change your, your clothes, had to wash them the, the, the next day. But the smell was... Pungent. It was. It was. It was incredible. But we just took it for granted then. I mean, I'd probably die of lung cancer. I don't smoke. But you know, my years spent in the pub, just breathing, smoking, night yeah. after night, yeah. function halls and things was was incredible when you mm. when you think of all of that. Um, but I remember. I mean, as a sports presenter, I used to present so many sporting events. You know, the Benson and Hedges, Masters, and uh, just it was everywhere. Were, everything mm. sponsored by mm. cigarettes. Mm. And I worked with this fantastic. Uh, presenter. He, he was absolutely brilliant, brilliant. I'm not naming him, but he's, you know, he's God in the presenting world. And um, and he would sit there and he would he would say, up next, we've got Jimmy White against Steve Davis. Great. You know, but before he would get to that, he'd be sitting going, <laughs> and, and 
have to stub it out. <laughs> Up next, Jimmy White against Steve <laughs> Davidson. But the cigarettes were given yeah. to all of us free. Yeah. You know, right. because, because Benson Hedges were there and they had all their... their, their... The good old days. The good old days. We were drinking oh. and smoking in the, in the workplace. No yeah. such... No. no well, such... I've seen people vaping here. Yes, yeah. that's not allowed. Yeah. That's... No, but they did. I mean, well, I know, but I've they're not allowed. Presenter, to. not you two at all. You two are absolutely perfect. But I mean, I, I... presenters, presenters, oh, oh. presenters who who vape between, you know, during the ad breaks. Oh, dear. But I think a lot of that, Leon, is uh, nervousness from people. People seem to need some sort of fix. I mean, it's like people can get angry, uh, and it's because they're nervous, or people can be smoking yeah, vapes yeah. or cigarettes because actually it's something makes to do, them, something calms to do them with down. You. something to do with your hands as well, isn't it? And if you're so used to it, and suddenly you're you're trying to give up. My parents smoked for a good chunk of when I was growing up, and they always said to me. If there's one thing you must not do, you must not copy mum and dad when it comes to smoking. And I've sort of hated it ever since. Um, but yeah, you see them trying to give up and it's tough. And I was really yeah. proud of them when they did give up because it's a real difficult thing to do. Yeah. If you're used to it, however many you smoke a day, suddenly it's taken away yeah. from you. It's hard, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's incredible. Liam, hard. what do you make of Liz Truss's book tour and uh, all the headlines she's grabbing from, from that? Um, the, the, the question of the lettuce, that uh, a lettuce lasted longer than her um, in the fridge. Um, and she says, this is pathetic. It's point scoring. This is the kind of thing that obsesses the kind of London elite. Yes, Liz Truss is back again, as if uh, as if we needed reminding of who she was and what she got up to. But I think it's not very helpful to Liz Truss's personal brand, this crusade, as if she's trying to make herself out of some sort of martyr who was unfairly targeted. I mean, the, the, the facts are the facts. And after that mini budget, the economy did go into uh, a bit of a spiral. I'm not saying she's responsible for the entire economic situation we find ourselves in, but we can't deny the mini budget was was pretty uh, horrific, but I bought the book because it sounds oh, as if you did it, it sounds as if there's going to be some interesting stuff <laughs> in there. Bought the t-shirt. I've bought the t-shirt. I think it's going to be interesting because she's clearly positioning herself for US audience, isn't mm. she? I think she's realised she's a bit of a laughing stock in the UK, probably because of the lettuce, mm. whether it's the London elite or not. Well, I don't think the Daily Star really kind of appeal to the London elite. What? The Daily Star no. is about as tabloid as it goes, and they're the ones that invented the lettuce. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. I mean, what one feels is that Liz Truss, she just she lives in a parallel universe. You know, I mean, she says anybody who thinks I crashed the economy is either malevolent or ignorant. I mean, it, it just, you, you, you just, it mm. beggars belief. Mm. Um, and I don't think she sees herself as a joke, actually. Do you, do you think she's got a chance, Scarlett, of, of coming back as, um, as leader? Because I know that there are some Conservatives, believe it or not, who do think that we'd have been better off well, we, and we as the Conservative Party, would have been better off with Liz Truss as the leader. Oh, yeah. No, I... I I, and I think there are quite a lot of viewers who think that too. I mean, I, I think, uh, but I also think the thing about MPs is never underestimate their ambition or yeah. their egos. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think most MPs think they would make really good leaders, and 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 it is addictive. Boris is waiting to be called back, but Mrs. Thatcher was waiting to be called back. I mean, of course, Liz thinks she wasn't given a chance yeah. because because probably the London elite got rid of her. I think, I think there's space for Liz Truss's policies. You know, I think there, there is space for those, but I don't think she was the right messenger. She was the right vehicle for it. And in a way, she's done more harm to that sort of political movement of freedom, of free low markets, tax, yeah. low tax. I think she's done more harm than good to that, which mm. obviously she wasn't intending to do. Mm. No, but her policies are terrible. I mean, her policies are about... I mean, remember, when, you know, we were getting to a cost-of-living crisis. We knew there were going to be terrible energy things. And she said, I don't believe in handouts. Instead of well, actually except then she was behind one of the largest, almost Corbyn-style handouts, the £40 billion it, energy it's package, forgotten, which it was... is forgotten because everybody, uh, you know, thinks that she was a Conservative with a small C, but yeah. that, that is... No, I mean, that was the, the, the biggest thing she did, as you say, was, was write a huge cheque for mm. people's energy bills, and we forgot about it because mm. I think the day after it was announced, the, the, the Queen passed away, mm. so it just sort of was consigned to history. But she was a big spender for the 49 days mm. she was in office, mm. um, and it's just a bit of a paradox because... I'm not sure Liz Truss believes the stuff she's saying now. I'm not sure she is this sort of rabid right-winger. I think she's actually fairly centrist, or was. She, I mean, all, she, we all knew what she would do when she got in. That's what... I mean, that's what her whole campaign against Rishi was. Was It was incredibly right-wing. And I remember having supper with, with two eminent economists, both of whom who said, well, as soon as she gets in, she'll change. 
and to their shock, I mean, that apart from the 40 billion, that she didn't. I mean, she did, you know, cut, start cutting taxes and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it was... It was I mean, Scarlett, I, you talk about cutting taxes, and I honestly, in my view, I don't think this country has ever been worse, maybe post-war or whatever, Second World War, but um, the roads particularly, everywhere I go, the amount of litter, the amount of graffiti, the roads are just Pot appalling. Mm. Pothole everywhere, mm. everywhere, absolutely everywhere, mm. and just rub bad surfaces, everything. And in my heart, I know there is no money to repair these. I don't think our roads will ever be repaired. Mm. I, I mean that ever. They will never be back to the way they were in the 60s or the or the 70s. And you just look and say, why doesn't somebody admit this? Where are we going to get this? Money from we are taxed to the hilt, and we were talking about tax mm. on uh, braziers yesterday, mm. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 I was talking about going out for fish and chips, and I bought some fish and chips mm. for my friends, and I, and it was thirty four quid. I said what? <laughs> and I and I said, give me the receipt, and I looked at the receipt. Five pounds seventy of our fish and chips was VAT. Mm. Really? Would you ever think there's VAT on your fish and chips? Because I wouldn't, you know? I, I, yes, oh, yeah, they've obviously changed. I remember maybe when it was, was taken, not takeaways. Yeah, if you were eating in, maybe. Or... Yeah. yeah. But, Eamon, you've hit the nail on the head. We're taxed to the eyeballs, and yet public services still don't work. So, and they're not good to work. So that tells me yeah. that they're not, money's not being managed properly. That yeah. we, don't have, we have waste. a huge problem with growth, and we've seen these economically inactive people increasing mm. again yesterday. We saw the IMF reducing its growth forecast for the UK yesterday, as well as the rest of Europe, has to be said. We have a growth problem, and it mm. goes back to Liz Truss. She was calling that out, mm. but perhaps not the right person to, yeah, she, to shout about she it. She was but, right to call that yeah. out. Well, we she was right to call it out, but she had all the wrong policies. No, but I don't think so, Scarlett, because you do have to drive growth through tax cuts and that type of thing. It was the wrong time, because if you tux, if you cut taxes when inflation's high, you're only going to cause more inflation. Yeah. So she should have waited. Lay the ground. But, but, yeah. but I suppose what I was saying, Leon, is if you cut taxes, then where are you ever going to get money to spend well, on public you're, services? You're, you're stimulating the economy, yeah, you're trying you get, to get more people working. Your tax receipts conversely mm. go up, don't well, they? Yeah, that's well, a theory. <laughs> that's a theory. I mean, it doesn't actually work. I mean, what you need for growth is you need investment. And and the problem with what we've got at the moment is business will not invest in Britain because they don't trust the government. And they, they say, you know, the problem, the problem with Rishi Sunak is he puts party before country. And we want stability. And actually what we need is we need, we need private investment to, to make this country go. And it's not about taxes. You sound actually. like a Conservative Scarlet. No, I'm private. saying it's not about taxes. <laughs> you say tax cuts will do it. I don't think it will. And I just think we have to, you know, we have to grow the green economy. Well, That's where the future is. I think is. the thing is, and I should announce this this morning, it is the end of the world. <laughs> and it is the fact that it is raining in Dubai, have a look at these pictures God, here. yes. Well, I mean, goodness me, a desert, right? Yeah. A desert, and they get a year's worth of rainfall in one day. That's and called climate change. No, well, they, they, they've, they've caused this. They've seeded the clouds. So they've tried, they've actually provoked this who, rain. Who, who did this? The, the, the government. So this is really? called cloud seeding. Yeah, because it doesn't rain in, in this part of the world. They've, they've, I don't know what the technology Well, it went a bit is. wrong there, didn't it? <laughs> That's the problem. And also, Dubai's not set up for rain because there's no drainage. Yes. Because it obviously doesn't rain ordinarily. Well, I need, I need to know more about this. Yeah, cloud What's... seeding. Oh. Cloud oh, seeding. Oh, well, I didn't, yeah. We'll, we'll talk I, about I, that more. Well, this was going to be a, 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 an arm in, in war and various things, and the Americans and the Russians very big into cloud seeding. So I didn't know that, Leon, but uh, what a blooming mess that yeah. is then. Mm. But it's interesting if this is man interfering with nature, or as um, uh, Scarlett is saying, this is climate change. OK, we're going to be talking about that as the, uh, the programme progresses mm -hmm. this morning. Again, let us know your views on some of the things we've been talking about. Love to hear from you, and this is how you do it. Uh, GBnews.com forward slash your say. So wild weather in Dubai yesterday. What's in store for you and me here in the UK? Alex Deacon with the forecast. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures. Pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and Northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, uh, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland. Uh, increasingly blustery here as well, but further south the winds will be light. Yes, it'll cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine we should again and get up to 13 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M1 in Leicestershire, there's a lane closed northbound after an accident between Junction 21A north of Leicester and Junction 22 at Ashby de la Zouche, causing delays. Trains aren't running between Ipswich and Stowe Market because of overhead lie problems caused by a fallen tree. In Confetti, the A465 is closed westbound from Thecoid to the Dulles Top Roundabout because of animals on the road. The A48M in Newport is closed southbound junction 29 of the M4 to St Melons after an accident. In Cardiff, the A48 is closed each way west of Culver House Cross after an accident. And train services in Hampshire have been stopped westbound from Porchester to Southampton Central and also from Porchester to Eastleigh. And that's because of a faulty train at Porchester. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. A very good morning to you. It's 7 o'clock. It is Wednesday the 17th of April. You are very welcome. Eamon and Isabel here. We're on GB News Breakfast with you until half past nine. Top story this morning, Nigel Farage has hit out at cancel culture in Brussels after police attempted to shut down the National Conservatism Conference. Your views welcome. The Prime Minister suffers a Tory backlash as key leadership contenders snub his smoking ban. And in just a moment, we'll be uh, revealing the latest inflation figures with Liam Halligan here to break down what it could mean for you. And the latest inflation number is 3.2%. UK prices rose by 3.2% during the year to March. We've just found out. What does that mean for you, your finances and for your family? Labour has announced new support for mental health in schools, but are they targeting private schools to do so. We'll be speaking to the Shadow Education Minister, Catherine McKinnell, very shortly. 
A pub in St Albans has sparked an online row over its child-free policy, which is our debate shortly. Is it unfair to ban children from pubs? Let us know what you think. And in the sports, a Champions League last night, Paris Saint-Germain came from behind to beat Barcelona. As Dortmund did the same to Atletico Madrid last night, so tonight, Arsenal head to Bayern Munich tonight. It's all level at 2-2 as Manchester City play Real Madrid at the Etihad, currently at 3-3. Is this confusing? Anyway, 100 days, we're going to celebrate that to the Olympic Games today. Mm -hmm. A gusty wind again across the east with a few showers. There will be a bit of rain in the west, particularly for Northern Ireland, but for many, it's going to be a fine and a bright day just on the fresh side. Join me later for all the details. So we start with some breaking news this hour. In the last few minutes, the Office for National Statistics has released their monthly inflation data and we've seen a drop. It's gone down to 3.2% for February, uh, down from 3.4%, sorry, for March, down from 3.2% <laughs> in February. So, Lynn Halligan, this is good news and lots of questions, I suppose, will be sparked about whether this could lead to interest rate cuts in the summer. It is good news, Isabel, because it's going in the right direction. Inflation is coming down. The cost of living squeeze is easing, at least in terms of the headline number. Numbers, though we know, of course, it's not for many people in their real lives. But I must say, this drop in inflation is less than was expected. This drop in inflation is actually quite small. Um, we've got two things going on at the moment. Uh, this reduction in inflation in the UK being less than expected, plus the fact that inflation in the US was much higher than expected. It's 3.5%. What's driving it in the US? In the US, it's mainly, I would say, um, oil prices. Mm. This is something I've been talking about for several months, that oil prices are going to come back high, geopolitical risk. That means that inflation is stubbornly high, and that means, I'm afraid, that interest rates in the US, and thus the interest rates in the UK, mm. are less likely to be cut any time mm -hmm. soon than they previously were. These inflation numbers are stubborn and that's going to cramp the style mm -hmm. of the uh, central banks when it comes to cutting rates. And this is why this, you know, in escalation of tensions in the Middle East matters to all of us here because yesterday we saw the FTSE having its biggest wobble in, you know, since July last year, worrying about everything happening there and we're also seeing risks of t to food prices going up again. We have indeed. Um, you know, British... In the British political scene is assuming still that inflation is going to come down, interest rates are going to come down, and it makes sense for the Tories to delay the election as long as they can as some kind of economic feel-good factor comes through. But guess what? It's the economy, stupid, as it always is. Yeah. These economic numbers are stubborn, stubbornly high in terms of inflation and making life difficult for uh, the Conservative government. The Bank of England will next decide on interest rates on May the 9th. Uh, so there's a few weeks to go yet. But on these numbers, there is no way we're going to see an interest rate cut in May and, uh, and probably not in June either unless things change because inflation is being pushed up by geopolitical tensions. These events are happening many, many miles away, but they impact us here in the UK through that mechanism. OK, well, you go away and mull over those figures and we'll talk again uh, later on in the programme. Liam Halligan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the thoughts now also of the Shadow Schools Minister, Catherine McKinnell, uh, on, on this. Catherine, good morning. Good morning. Just looking for your initial response to that uh, inflation rate. Uh, it's down 3.4 to 3.2, but, you know, only by... 0.2 percent. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm hearing this news as you're hearing it, um, and clearly any drop uh, is is welcome. But we know, and as your commentator said there, that this is not uh, good news being felt in people's pockets. We know that everyone coming up to remortgage their home is paying, on average, uh, you know, way more than they would if we hadn't had that disastrous mini budget a couple of years ago and um, and we know that people are really struggling so and it's still below um, expectations as well so I think uh, whilst any news is good news there's still a long way to go before people start feeling better and this country starts turning around because really it's years of chaos that is holding this country back uh, in terms of our economy in terms of economic growth in terms of people's stability and security and ability to get on and build their lives um, we got the uh, figures in yesterday for economic 
economic in inactivity and uh, an increase in the number of people who aren't working, one fifth now of the British population. We've seen unemployment uh, rise and as you say, inflation coming down uh, more slowly than perhaps lots of people were hoping. How would any of that be different under a Labour administration? Because a lot of the challenges, certainly in relation to inflation, as Liam was explaining, to do with geopolitics. Not a lot you can do in Westminster, is there? Well, I think there's an awful lot we can do as a country to turn this country around after 14 years of, quite frankly, quite failing and chaotic government. I mean, I've been elected since 2010 and it's been a litany of failures as far as I can see. And I think the voters can see that too. We need a general election as soon as possible because, quite frankly, the country needs stable government. And that's what we don't have. We saw even yesterday on a matter such as smoking, the current government can't even come together and decide and had to have a free vote. So um, appreciate this is a much longer discussion about our economy and how we've rebuilt it. And obviously Labour has a lot of good ideas, a lot of proposals, a lot of things that we're itching to get into government and to implement to really kickstart our economy and, and ensure we have that growth in every part of our country. But whilst we're clinging on to this current government, um, we're just going to keep going backwards. But Catherine, one of these ideas that, that Labour has is um, mental health support in schools and you want that mental health support there in in every school and uh, i'm not saying whether it should or shouldn't be there there's certainly a huge awareness now uh, amongst children amongst parents amongst school teachers that they need that extra support but that support costs how are you going to pay for that so you're absolutely right. It is a priority for us. We see a real crisis in the mental health of our young people, and I think your viewers do too. We know that there are almost half a million children waiting to see someone about their mental health. It's just appalling. It's a scandal, and it's, it's brewing up problems for the long term mm. as well. So Labour would prioritise this, and we would pay for it by mm. removing the tax exemptions that private schools mm. currently enjoy. We appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, facing challenges in terms of the economy and the mismanagement by the government, but ultimately our priority would mm. be putting that money, which we would raise, 1.3 to mm. 1.5, Five billion. That's been independently verified, and we would put that into our schools uh, mm. for more teachers, but particularly as well for mental health support, a mental health specialist advisor in every secondary school. And we also invest in community hubs as well to make sure that children can get that support where they need it mm. and where they want to access it. And we'd make sure we would um, cut down these CAMS waiting lists as well. But those are health initiatives. Um, and so, but in terms of our education system our state schools desperately need this boost and our young people desperately need this mental health support and Labour has a plan a clear plan costed mm. to deliver it it's a strange way of doing it though isn't it because essentially what you're doing by increasing taxes on private school is forcing a huge number of pupils that aren't taking up their places that are paid for by the state back into the state sector at the moment that's money that the state isn't having to spend a whole bunch of children won't be able to afford these increased fees and those kids will then be swamping the state sector. I think it's a bit divisive to say that mental health is being prioritised ahead of this. A lot of children should be getting mental health provision irrespective of taxation and private schools. So Absolutely. It, it, it has been a priority for us and it's why we've made this decision. Um, I do think government is about um, taking decisions and choosing our priorities. Um, but ultimately, in terms of private schools, it, it is a tax break that they currently enjoy and that we think that public money should mm. be spent in our state schools. Why where nine don't you want to apply that? Are educated that taxation to the private health sector though because you're only going after education which predominantly affects well only affects young people but you, you're actually saying we're streeting you're saying we're not going to add VAT onto private health and that's something that tends to affect largely people needing the NHS people of older years is this discriminatory actually against younger people so this is very much focused on our education system. We know that nine out of 10 children are educated in the state sector. And let's bear in mind as well that private schools have increased their fees above inflation over the last uh, 10 years. There's been no decrease in the number of children attending uh, private schools, but we have seen a massive decrease in that support and funding yeah, but you're not that goes my question to our about, state about schools. And the gap health. has really What's grown different? between the funding. 
Uh, well, I mean, it's a much uh, a different proposition in terms of private health. But we are not we are not against people making choices about how they educate their children or indeed how they spend their money and how they <coughs> choose to live. What we are making decisions around is how mm. the taxpayer's money is targeted in our system. And that's a decision that we've taken, that the state's school sector, we have a shortage of teachers, we have a crisis in mental health, we have mm. uh, real challenges in our school system. And if we want to build that economy of the future, which I said, Labour is really ambitious for this country and really turning around the economic situation that we see, then we have to invest in our children in order to build that better future for everybody. Catherine, if you were spending taxpayers' money in Belgium, um, all the situation in, in, in Brussels at this NatCon conference, would you have spent it on sending the police in to um, break up the, the conference? Good, good pivot there. Um, I, I, in terms of policing decisions, in Brussels. Obviously, that's an operational matter for the police, and I wouldn't expect people in Brussels to comment on operational policing decisions that are taken here in the UK. Um, but I, I do think there are some concerning aspects to what happened yesterday. Um, and I think Rishi Sunak has some questions to answer about his mm. own MPs and, and who they're associating with. And obviously, you know, that there, there are issues of freedom of speech, freedom of association, all of that Labour absolutely supports. But you've got to question whether Rishi Sunak, as the Prime Minister, should be comfortable with his MP, Suella Braverman, who was down to speak and share a platform mm. with some highly divisive figures uh, who, who were there, going to be there on that platform at that event in Brussels yesterday. So I think it's an operational matter for the Brussels police, but I think Rishi Sunak has some answers, uh, questions to answer here in the UK. Catherine McKinnell, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for all that you talked about today. Um, Catherine is the Shadow Education uh, Minister. Appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. Uh, well, let's focus on that uh, controversial um, action yesterday taken in Brussels. The National Conservatism Conference is due to continue today. Attempts were made yesterday to entirely shut down the event by the local mayor. And the local mayor is Emir Kerr, who opposed everything going on. Um, he is uh, very left-wing, uh, as these lot are very right-wing, and he claims he issued the order to... Uh, ensure public security. Well, Nigel Farage was actually uh, on stage when all of this was taking place, and this is what he had to say. The police are outside the door as I speak. They will not let anybody else in. There are three police there. They have an order to close down this event, and when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do, it's the events here in Brussels today. Well, the move to shut it down was labelled unacceptable by the Belgian Prime Minister and a UK government source told GB News it's unclear exactly what's happened here, but the scenes will worry anyone who believes in free speech. Free society should be confident enough to allow free debate. And we'll be taking your views on that very shortly. However, Labour quick to point out uh, the calibre of attendees. Um, so, so basically we were getting some uh, inference that uh, towards them from Catherine McConnell, who we've just spoken to. Um, these attendees, Suella Braverman's there. Uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, is there as well. Have a listen to this. I think some of the speakers, from what I understand, who have been advertised on the website for this conference have very unsavoury views. I'm rather surprised that Suella Braverman's been allowed to go and speak at this event. Why is Rishi Sunak not getting a grip of this situation? Why is he not asking Suella Braverman to pull out of this event? Because some of the characters involved, at least according to their website, have made all kinds of comments which I don't think the Rishi Sunak's Tory party would want to associate themselves with. Well, oh. high in control is Rishi Sunak off his, uh, his own party. Our political correspondent Olivia Utley uh, with her thoughts on this. Good morning, Olivia. Good morning. I mean, 
It was a fascinating uh, event yesterday in Brussels. I don't think any of us were expecting when the NatCon conference started for it to be closed down by uh, Brussels police from the order of the socialist mayor. Remember, of course, that the National Conservative Conference uh, had its first meeting in London last year, and Sadiq Khan, who many people consider really quite left-wing, made absolutely no move whatsoever to close down uh, the conference. Rishi Sunak has come out uh, fighting about this. He says that it's very concerning and a, a threat to free speech. But Labour, interestingly, you could see there in your interview with, uh, with, with Catherine, couldn't quite decide what line to take, sort of hesitated for a minute and suggested that it was a, an operational decision. And I think that is going to be the question in the coming days. If the mayor of Brussels and the Brussels police had evidence, which some are suggesting, that there would be disorder later in the day at the event, then perhaps there is an argument that they were simply making an operational decision to close down the protest. But all of the organisers of the protest, and lots of the speakers who were there, including Nigel Farage, say that actually what this was was a, 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 a political decision dressed up as an operational decision. They say that the, 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 the people closing down this event simply didn't want it to take place because they didn't like the views that they were hearing. If that does turn out to be the case, of course, it is far, far more concerning. We'll just have to wait and see. Olivia, thank you very much indeed. Let's have a look at other news that uh, you're waking up to on this Wednesday morning. The Chancellor has just responded uh, to the latest inflation figures. Uh, they've eased to 3.2%, down from 34 He said uh, the plan is working. Inflation is falling faster than expected, down from over 11% to 3.2%, the lowest level in nearly two and a half years, uh, helping people's money to go further. I'd just like to, to bring in Liam Halligan, who's beside that. <laughs> I mean, he's making the most of this one isn't he? Uh, um, what would you say to what he said? I'd say inflation's come down this morning, but by less than expected. This 3.2 number is only a little bit below the 3.4 number in February, as you said, just a drop of 2.2 percentage points. This will make it harder for the Bank of England to cut yeah, interest yeah. rates anytime soon. So it's going to make it harder for all of us. It's going to... Well, some you know, GB News viewers and listeners who live on their savings will be happy that interest rates are probably going to stay higher mm. for longer. And, and you know, we, we mustn't forget savers in this debate, and we often do. But, of course, you'll have many families who are weathering mortgages, who are coming up to re renewing their home loans at a higher rate uh, and the fact that interest rates which were expected to fall in May or June are now almost certainly not going to fall in May or June will make household budgeting more difficult for millions of UK families. Liam, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the Rwanda plan has been dealt a series of defeats in the House of Lords, further delaying passage of the bill through Parliament. Despite MPs in the Commons overturning previous changes by the House of Lords, peers have again pressed demands for revisions to the bill. Uh, well, despite passing through the Commons yesterday, the government's smoking ban bill has exposed a rift within the Conservative Party. Nearly half of Conservative MPs, including five leadership hopefuls, failed to support the bill. Sir Jake Berry was one of those MPs. I want to live in a country where the government tells you what car to buy, what central heating you can have in your phone, looks to arrest you for misgendering people. I believe in freedom. And if you are free as a nation, you, it's freedom to make good choices as well as bad choices. This is slipping towards a sort of social democratic, socialist country. Frankly, if all freedom means to you is you have the freedom to do what the government tells you you can do, you may as well move to Russia or China. Budget airline EasyJet suspended flights to Tel Aviv for the next six months following more uncertainty in Israel over the weekend. The flights will be halted until the 27th of October with customers being offered a full refund. Uh, look at this, torrential rain and flooding in Dubai, uh, flooding throughout the whole city as authorities urge people to stay at home. Now, we're not sure if this is what was called rain seeding or climate change. We're going to find out more about that as the programme uh, progresses. But as you can see there, streets, cars, swamped in water, Dubai airport uh, completely flooded. Operations, uh, they say, temporarily diverted. They have since restarted. cloud seeding. Yes, yes. Apparently they sent six 
salt flares into the air to try and promote and cause rain. But obviously, I think this was perhaps a little bit more than they wanted. Um, but there's real questions, I suppose. So you do um, think it is connected? They've, they've said that they they did send these these salt flares and other materials out. In, they had a cloudy day and they wanted to make the most of it, so they they caused rain precipitation. Um, a bit more, perhaps, than, than they intended to wow. do. I hope, a bit like when we get inundated with water, that they've done a better job at managing to store some of it in reservoirs and things, because, um, you know, goodness knows they need it out there. Yeah. Well, somebody must be firing the salt flares up around <laughs> the UK, I would have thought, at the minute. A lot of rain. Uh, Alex Deegan, good morning. Here's the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures. Pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and Northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, uh, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland. Uh, increasingly blustery here as well, but further south the winds will be light. Yes, it will cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine we should again and get up to 13 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. What are we back in vision Ooh, for? The competition, the Great oh. British Giveaway. <laughs> we are. Yes. Um, you could win a £10,000 Greek cruise, a luxury travel bundle and a whopping £10,000 in cash. Is how? Do you know what I was reading there? Oh. Which would be the strongest animal <laughs> on earth um, in a fight? No wonder you were so engrossed. You no, know, I was. You know, would it be a, a hippopotamus? Would it be a crocodile? Oh. Would it be an elephant? Would it be a tiger? Whatever, whatever. Hippopotamus? Whatever. We're going to... Well, well, hippopotamus got a got a big bite and big mm. teeth, it has to be said. We're going to be talking about that in the, uh, the news review just after half past seven but right now here's how you could get all those things Isabel was talking about with thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Mm. Ireland, there tends to be more relaxation towards pub rules in Ireland, certainly when I was growing up. I remember certain pubs you couldn't go into right. as a child, uh, but then neither could women go into them either. <laughs> okay. So they were men only yeah. sort of pubs, right? But then, particularly in the countryside, the kids 
Mm. You know, we'd go every Sunday. My, mm. my, in, my in-laws, outlaws, uncles, aunts would all meet up and they would yeah. all drive out to the country and down by the coast or whatever it is. Yeah. And then we'd play in the car park and, yeah. uh, and they were in there all day. And we could be in there all day if we wanted to. However, a North London pub, and this is what we're going to be talking about after the break, has caused a big row by banning children from pubs. Yes, is that fair? I will be debating that after this. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Right, I hope you're going to raise a glass to this next debate we're going to have in London, in North London. A pub has sparked a debate over uh, its latest rule, um, which bans children. I get a bit confused in this because I thought children would be banned everywhere if they're under 16 or so from not being Not anymore, in a pub. not anymore. You so, go, because so, a lot of these pubs, to be honest, aren't really drinking establishments anymore, are they? Everybody goes houses. to pubs to eat these days. Well, what, are you, what are you saying? You're saying around the country, so if we're in Devon, over in Yorkshire, whatever, you yeah, can yeah. bring your kid into a pub. Yeah. And that's OK. Yeah, you can right. take your baby and do whatever you want. Um, but Lower Red Lion in St Albans, uh, they're a little bit different. They've made headlines after a social media user posted a photograph of the sign outside the pub saying, dog friendly, child free. Mm. Mm. <laughs> OK, so we're asking, should children be allowed in pubs? Now, joining us now, relationship coach Fahama Mohammed and uh, parenting journalist Annette Kello uh, on this one. Uh, Annette, why do you think it it's OK? 
Well, I don't think this is the Victorian ages. I think we need to think about the economy as well. Where's the money coming from? Parents are everywhere. And like you said, Devon, places like that, there many of them are based on seaside, people coming together. And I think we have to remember, family is community. So taking them out with you, you know, with my son, five days born, I went for some champagne, why not? And I carried that on. I take him to restaurants, pubs, I draw the line at a nightclub, maybe. <laughs> but I think it's all good fun. And I think people should appreciate that children are here. I feel like the UK is very anti-children at the moment. Mm, so, Fahima, are you anti-children by saying you don't think children should be welcome in a pub? I mean, there's nothing more unkind, really, to say children not welcome makes them lower than dogs. Well, that's looking at it from a parent's perspective and saying that, you know what, at the end of the day, I want to have my kids involved. But actually, if you want to understand that kids do mimic, and yes, there might be certain places that are really friendly towards children, but a lot of them, they're not actually designed, nor the environment can be controlled. And I think, that, like you said, there's everywhere is for children. Why couldn't they be designated areas where there is just for adults, whether it's clubs, pubs, bars, and shisha cafes, because it is restrictive to the age because you don't want to be able to be sitting in certain places mm -hmm. where you feel that you know you have to be aware because of children your language your behavior and especially when it's substance involved then you don't know what the outcome is even if you are behaving but in if a we're talking about way, a, a nice pub where they're serving Sunday lunch there aren't drunken louts lounging about there are people we don't know that great bread but how often do you see on a Sunday lunchtime in a pub people rolling around I live around in drunk? Surrey Richmond mm -hmm. and I see whether it's in the outside or not obviously I don't drink and I don't go to pubs, but at the end of the day, I feel that adults deserve a place just for themselves mm. where they don't have to feel that they have to be aware of children. Because, like you said, even restaurants everywhere is family designated. Mm. So why not have a space where it's just for adults? Well, I, I am old enough to remember when you would go into a pub um, in, the, in the 60s or 70s, there was the men's bar and then there was the lounge bar where women were only allowed in. They weren't allowed to come outside that at all, but they could sit in the lounge bar um, as well. Um, and I do remember as, as kids, you're always allowed in with your father and the pub, but not so much with the, the women in, in the lounge bar. So do you really want to go to, you know, where you're designating everything? I just it's think... It's not designation. I think it's more also we're teaching children that, you know what, we're inviting them and they're so exposed to so many different things. Yeah. And it's just nice to keep them slightly separated for certain things. And well, again, it's such mm. a limited sort of like amount of place where you can go. But if I was looking for socialisation in a pub and it was full of screaming kids and whatever it is, I'd vote, OK, I'd vote with my feet, I'd go elsewhere. Even still, I just think that it shouldn't be there for children. It's not just about the adults. I think children yeah. shouldn't be exposed to certain, you know, uh, environments and certain places and people where you have no control. Yeah. And they're not actually, you know, child-friendly, most of these and places that, what anyway. about What about these scenarios? I mean, we're talking about perhaps drunken behaviour, bad language around children that you might encounter there. What about adults who are basically anti-children. You know, your, your child's in that pub, and we've all experienced it as parents, where perhaps a grumpy person will be sort of tutting or staring at you because your child's deigned to breathe. Why put yourself in that environment? Surely there should be spaces where these grumpy people can be left on their own. Well, in that case, they probably need to go to a grumpy pub, and we'll designate <laughs> it for only grumpy people who do not like children. But I've had that myself. I was in a restaurant, and my son was there, and somebody said, you're not bringing that child in here, are you? And I was like, oh, yes, I am. Mm. And he just sat there went straight to sleep and no problem. So I think a lot of it, A, goes down to the parent. You know, parents aren't going to go, let me go to a really crazy, rough pub and let's see some fights with their kids. I mean, well... Yeah. I hope not. And it may not so start off like that, but it I, will end up like that because look as you like... drink throughout the night, you're, you know, you will change, become more tipsy, or you want that peace and quiet, or the behaviour mm. might actually extend. Why would you put your child at that risk in the first place? But I don't you look get that. at places like France, Spain, Italy. There's a different culture there. We know the English and their drink. Yeah, well, it depends where you go. Not at the Ritz, darling.
Um, well, I must say, actually, well, I, like I said, I'm in Richmond, and you know, it's quite, you know, affluent. And at the end of the day, you still feel yeah. and you'll still see the rowdiness because of the youngsters. Um, and at the French, though, they're not particularly child-friendly, in my experience. Oh, really? um, yeah, I've had more aggro in restaurants with my kids in France than I've had in this country. But the Spanish, I just love the attitude. You're in a bar, you're in a restaurant, and they come and squeeze your child's cheeks. Oh, guapa! They literally love your child, and you love them forever. Give them a big tip, and it's just a family feeling mm. not in France <laughs> yeah maybe not but I, I do like that community feel and I feel children are about community and I think it does depend where you go and also it teaches children they're at the table this is how we eat it's different but then they'll see an adult that's not behaving and that's just not right because they also get you're assuming, assuming every, every adult say, I'm, I'm not assuming I'm just saying there is yeah. more of a risk in I've those never seen sort of any environments you, you've it's admitted you, you don't go into pubs so but I have got friends but, I, but I have seen, seen I have seen, I've got mm. friends that go and, like I said, there's shisha bars, there's, mm. you know, um, clubs, there are bars, mm. just generally. Okay. And that's just for adults, I think. Mm. And we, well, they should have that space for I themselves. Well, um, I personally, I think I've been converted to a grumpy pub. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to follow up the grumpy the grumpy pub with the grumpy airline uh, uh. as well, Annette. I think that would be, be quite good as well. Um, thank you both very much indeed. Thank very thought-provoking. Thank, thank you very you. much and cheers to both of you. Um, let us know what you think. You can have your say by going to gbnews.com forward slash your say and get involved in our discussion this morning. We'll try and read out some of those a little bit later on. But in the meantime, uh, stay with us because coming up, the Olympic medals might be bronze, silver and gold, but this year they'll have something special in them. Find out what. Next. What, cash? Maybe. Mm. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Train services in Suffolk are suspended between Ipswich and Stowe Market. It's because of overhead line problems caused because of a fallen tree that's damaged the lines. There's some quite extensive work that's required in order to fix the issue. Now, Merthyr Tidville, the A465 heads of the Valleys Road, is closed in both directions between the Gullis Top Roundabout and the A469 at the Rimney Interchange after animals were on the road. That causing queues in both directions. Cardiff, the a48 is closed in both directions west of Culverhouse Cross because it's 29 and 28 from the A127 to the A12 causing queues. And trains have been stopped westbound from Porchester to Southampton Central because of a faulty train. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel.
Now, we've got a lot of Olympic things to discuss because it is 100 days mm. from today to the Paris Olympics start. And Paul's here now to talk about uh, particularly the medals. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. Do you know how many medals they're putting together? Here comes the quiz again. No, no idea. Olympics and Paralympic medals, so you've got gold, silver, bronze. How many do you think More they have to ever, cast? because they just keep expanding the number of sports, don't they? Mm. Well, there has dancing, to be hundreds. There has to be hundreds. 5,000 wow. and 84 medals. And these are great medals. Now, look at this. Now, there's the gold looks medal. Looks well, looks well. Very nice. Now, you see the bit in the middle? Yeah. See, it looks like it's, it's kind of iron. Now, that is actually... It was hexagonal which represents the shape of France, but the actual iron is taken from the Eiffel Tower. Get out of it. Absolutely true. So, wait a minute, there's 5,000 odd medals. <laughs> I know you're going to go. There's 5,000 I mean, bits. It's going to tip over. <laughs> the Leaning Tower of Eiffel. The Leaning Tower of Eiffel. The Leaning Tower of Eiffel is slightly falling over. I wonder how they do that. Well, what they do is that they have to replace bits of the Eiffel Tower every now and again because it gets a little rusty, so they cut oh, it so off. Oh, so they've taken the rusty have, bits. But they have a secret <laughs> stash of Eiffel Tower they have done for years, and they actually do keep it secret in case anybody tries to nick it. So, what they've done then is melt it down and those little bits mm -hmm. in the middle are from the Eiffel Tower, which I think is a really? lovely thing. Hey, so do you think it's a lovely uh, idea as well? Is it a lovely idea to introduce prize money to uh, gold medal winners? I don't have a problem with it. I know people say, oh, it's against Olympic ideals, it's not what Pierre de Coubertin would have liked back in 1896, but, you know, the way things are going, you know, the sport is professional these days and you can't have amateurs taking part in this because it's not just a, a fact that you could just train every now and again and then go in the Olympics. It's a, it's a full-time job and I don't have a problem with it. It's, it's, it's actually Sebastian Coe that's come out with it, yes, Lord yeah, Coe, yeah. for World Athletics. So it's only the track and field events that will get this $50,000 should they win a gold yeah, medal. Which in itself creates argument. I know, as and to... then you've got swimmers mm -hmm. who are spending as much time and are not going to get any penny. But it's all about the gold. So that's obviously no, what they, they're not ones. doing it for the money. They do it. It's for... also about the costumes ah. and, and the, the outfits, what they're wearing. Have you heard about so, this? No. So we're going to look at the American outfit now. Nike yeah? are in trouble again. Oh, so yes. after we had the, you know, the, the St George's flag and the back of the yeah, yeah. shirts. Have what a look at this done? now. Looks fine to me. How would you feel about wearing the one on the right there? As a woman. Eamon. Mm. Uh, well, no, 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 Isabel, what, what do you oh, think? It reminds me of my PE knickers days at school where you had to wear, you know, essentially not an awful lot it's, of leg coverage. It's very high riding, it's very high riding. It's barely covering the bikini line, and so athletes are saying, you know, th you know th there could be some wardrobe malfunctions in the Olympics. Well, you see, you know, the high jumpers and the hurdlers, they all wear essentially knickers, don't they? So They do, but apparently they're even more oh, higher revealing cut. than before. But Nike have come back, so they've got a choice of 50 different things. So it's not just where, oh, the men are wearing this and the women have to wear this. It's disgraceful and degrading to women. They have an absolute oh, right. choice. So there's plenty so of different ones. Nothing, it's what you it's all well, yes. I mean, I've been studying this. There's a whole Instagram page about <laughs> um, women uh, and how they dress in sporting and in international sport. Yeah. And I've been studying this. I'm, I'm sure I'm you just... have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you yes. the address later on. OK, we'll fine. A... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, I will study very carefully and I'll come back to you tomorrow. Thank you, my friend. Thank Paul Coit there with um, the sport. Right, we're going to take a look at the front pages of your newspapers this morning. The Times is leading with the police investigation into Angela Rayner. Uh, they say that they are examining several allegations not limited to possible electoral law offences. Uh, Daily Telegraph leads with nearly half of Conservative MPs failing to support Rishi Sunak's smoking ban. That is despite it passing through Parliament last night. The Guardian is leading with Rishi Sunak's ban on smoking as well. Uh, they say dozens of Conservative MPs voted against the government. Daily Mail, it leads with the landmark High Court ruling that backed the prayer ban at a Muslim... Uh, uh, sorry, at a school after a Muslim pupil claimed it was a breach of her human rights not to pray. Oh. Right, so joining us now to talk through uh, those stories and lots more, uh, Scarlett Maguire and Leon Emerali. Um, guys, an opinion on the, the prayer thing at school? Well, for me, I think it's the right thing. I think, you know, school isn't a place for, for, for prayers. Um, she's a tough headmistress, this lady, and I think the biggest issue is that £150,000 of taxpayers' money was spent on this court case because mm. uh, it was through legal aid. And I just think it's a bit of a waste of money, is it not? It's common sense that mm. she, they shouldn't be praying. Who decides how legal aid is, is apportioned? 
Whose fault is that, that they were able to get their hands on that, on that aid, legal aid? Anybody know? Um, well, 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 for a start, the solicitors say it's nothing like 150,000. Oh, right, right. um, and, and the solicitors uh, talk to somebody in, who, who agrees. No, I think it's perfectly reasonable. I, I, think, I think it's absolutely reasonable that a child says, I want, I want the right to pray. And actually, now nobody can do anything about it. It is now British law mm. that in a secular school, you do not have the right to pray. What and I actually think is slightly amusing about all of this is children think they can do anything they want. I want to be a cat. <laughs> I want to be, you know, tickled on the tummy and have a litter tray and whatever, whatever it is. And now somebody's saying, no, you're not. This is the law. You can't do this. Yeah, find that quite. It's common sense. I think pe people are starting to to say actually, you know, we have to inject a little bit of common mm. sense into our schooling and how we raise children. And I think it's it's fair. Mm -hmm. But All would right. you look if any of us were a head teacher and we had to g get a, a you know a day's class together mm. and and somebody saying, well, at midnight I've got to down tools. But all these other kids are saying, well, we don't down tools because we're not a Muslim in all of this. Whew, it's a big dilemma, isn't it? It's a bit divisive. It's a bit divisive. I think that's probably where this issue comes about is, well, do you, how far do you go to accommodate these people? But if you are having to pray multiple times a day, if it is getting in, in the way of your lessons, mm. Then I think it's fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we talk um, about this NatCon um, shutdown yesterday? Um, we've had a couple of Labour voices, Scarlett, saying this morning that there are questions for the Prime Minister about who he's letting Conservative Swella Bravman rub shoulders with and that there are questionable speakers at this event. And a few of our viewers ha have pointed out, well, hang on a minute, isn't that a hypocrisy from the Labour Party where there are plenty of people on these um, pro-Palestinian uh, peace marches uh, on the streets of London rubbing shoulders with, with people who are inciting hatred? You can't control who you rub shoulders with. What matters is, is freedom of speech oh, and the think, right to protest in, in that instance. I think they're completely... I, th I think it's completely different. I mean, you know, d d obviously, Suella Braverman is perfectly happy to be on the same platform as Viktor Orban, who is the uh, president of Hungary uh, and is a fairly mad right winger frankly and and that's what that's what that whole thing is i mean on 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 the on the palestinian ones i mean i i don't know how many labor mps go on it but but there are thousands and thousands of people you're not but, but, but just because somebody is in your words a mad right winger is that grounds for shutting down an event no, no I, I mean i didn't say it was mm. i mean i think i actually think it's completely counterproductive is we we would barely have heard of this wretched thing had they not tried to shut it down um and they need to think about it. But if you're talking about the Palestine stuff, the number of Palestinian meetings that have been closed... I mean, I'm talking about, about uh, b book fairs where you have, where you have Palestinian authors that, that they're, not, they're no longer allowed to speak. I mean, actually, that's been going on around Europe, particularly in Germany. Um, anything, in any Palestinian thing that... that it's very, very difficult to find a venue for. So, actually, you need it on both sides. Thank you, Scarlett. Uh, right, Scarlett and Leon, they'll be back after the break, as will we, and we will be asking you the question, who would win in a fight, a tiger or an elephant? And we've got lots more animals to add to that list, but think about it. Would a tiger beat an elephant or an elephant beat a tiger after this? Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 p.m. So, J. Cole, who is a rapper, says he felt terrible after releasing a song aimed at fellow rapper Kendrick Lamar and vowed to pull the track off streaming services. He said, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. Uh, the past two days <laughs> felt terrible, he told an audience at the uh, Dreamville Festival in North Carolina. I damn near had a relapse, he said. There's a lot of young people, especially, you know, that would look at that and they will take it not just as entertainment. It doesn't happen in any other form of art that I can think of. This is not happening in country music, is it? Can't well, it's the, same, it's the same problem in both cases, isn't it? Who's doing the regulating? And surely it's each case on its merits, isn't it? It's, you don't just ban a genre. Why is there such a lot of hatred for a man who usually would have trash-talked back mm. 
to stand up and say, you know, this doesn't sit well with me and I love this guy. If we look at, I think his name was Cody Fisher, the semi-professional footballer who died in a club yeah. because someone stabbed him. Yeah. Now, he was stabbed because he stepped on someone's trainers. This is the level of ego we're seeing from a lot of young men who don't have any output <laughs> of being able to channel that energy and a lot of it is stemming from cultures like football, hip-hop, these sorts of things. So I'm just saying it's refreshing to see yeah. a man yeah. who could have easily wiped the floor with his lyrics say, I don't have to. You know? But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I almost I took this interview the wrong direction. It's not about pointing out the areas of concern. Actually, this story is saying, look, music Balance. and art can be giving you an example of how to live a slightly better That's life. That's free speech. Saying, yeah. sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry I choose not to fight back because I love you. It may look like a wimpy thing to do, but it's still free speech. You know what? I, agree. I love you, Paul. Sorry about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Leon and Scarlett are here and they're talking about the big news stories of the day and one of the biggest ones is in the Sun today and they are asking, they've, got, they've had AI, AI intelligence put together um, a list of beasts of the natural world out there as to who would win in various fights between them. So you can have here, you can have sharks, crocodiles, a number of crocodiles, different types of crocodiles, polar bear, squid, um, that's a big squid. It's what's called a colossal squid. Uh, hippopotamus, uh, elephant, tiger, um, another crocodile in there. So who would be crowned the toughest animal on earth? Well, it boils down to an elephant AI works out who would win in each fight, and it works out that it'll be an African elephant against a tiger. But which one of those two would have the mm. upper hand, tooth, claw, whatever? What do you think? Well, you see, the elephant could just squash the mm. tiger, but the tiger, I mean, if it claws the mm. elephant, um, I mean, could bring it down. I think an elephant's got quite thick skin, so mm. I think it could take a bit of a clawing, and, and it's massive, so if it does lose a bit of blood, it's not going to be fatal. Yeah. Um, the thing about tigers and lions, whatever, they take uh, animals down by the hind legs as you were saying there, so they would they would get their teeth into the hind leg and pull the animal down. Could it pull an African I elephant down? I think this down? is... AI's got it wrong, because African elephants would never meet tigers, because they are <laughs> on different continents. You don't find yeah, tigers in Africa, so they base that on <laughs> elephants you'd find in Asia, which are smaller than elephants <laughs> you'd find in Africa, so the statistics are skewed, so I'm backing the tiger, contrary to what AI says. Yeah, yeah. No, but the tiger would still have to take on an African elephant in a fight, and if it did <laughs> So, AI says that a, an elephant would be triumphant. And not uh, a crocodile, because I feel a crocodile... No, there's, be... there's three types of crocodile in the top ten here. Uh, a shark would do well, crocodile, a Nile crocodile, a colossal squid, polar bear, for, <laughs> let's not forget <laughs> lethal killing machines, uh, another shark, a leopard, hippopotamus, big beast, um, another crocodile, mm. uh, then the Siberian tiger and the African elephant. Well, you were right, Scarlett. Hippos kill more humans than any other animals, yeah. certainly in Africa. Yeah. You get between a hippo and the water, you can forget it. Yeah. Mm. You're, I mean, you're done. They're quick as well, aren't they? You, you see Very these, fast, surprisingly. Mm, mm. Yeah. People, you see these hippos and you think, oh, yeah, and, I mean, they're vegetarians, it's mm. not as though they're going to go after you. Bang. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I've, I've seen a lot of things on Instagram. I have done safaris um, mm. a couple of times and um, I remember the worst thing about it was um, seeing this, these little... Uh, Gazelles? No, uh, 
lions, these oh, little, right. uh, what are they called? Puppy lions. Cubs. 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 Cubs, Cubs. And there's six of them walking up the road with the mother. And we all stop and we go, wow, that's incredible. And everybody whispers, that's amazing. <laughs> and we're standing looking at it, and then the biggest roar comes. <laughs> we're about Isabel sitting <laughs> for me here. <laughs> And everybody forgot where the hell's the daddy. <laughs> the, daddy the daddy was sitting there, and uh, and the funny thing was that the the guide on our uh, Land Rover at the time, so he reaches for his rifle. Mm. There's no bullet in it. Oh. There's no bullet in it. He has to load the blooming rifle. But luckily, we got away. We got away. It was all okay. Um, but there can be some rogue elephants out there too. <gasps> fascinates me. All these nature programs on telly fascinates me. So not on your Nelly. Um, so a, li a tiger would. Not not beat an elephant, an African elephant, in a scrap, however unlikely that would yes, be. Yes, there we go. Uh, we'll have more from Leon and Scarlett and other AI polls later in the next <laughs> paper review. But for now, we say thank you to both of you. And hello, Alex Deakin. What's in store weather-wise? That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures. Pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and Northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, uh, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland. Uh, increasingly blustery here as well, but further south the winds will be light. Yes, it'll cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine we should again and get up to 13 degrees. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Merthyr Tydfil. The A465 Heads of the Valleys Road is closed in both directions between the Dulles Top Roundabout and the A469 at the Rimney Interchange. Because of animals on the road, there are queues each way as a result. And delays too as you divert. Now in Wiltshire on the A419, there are southbound delays because of an accident between the White Hart Roundabout and the Common Head Interchange in Swindon. In Essex on the A12, the northbound entry slip roads partly blocked by an accident at Junction 20B at Hatfield Peveril. And the overground services are suspended between Gospel Oak and Stratford with severe delays between Gospel Oak and both Richmond and Clapham Junction because of a faulty train. And in West Sussex, there's a report of an accident on the A23 southbound at Hand Cross causing delays. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. From for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Uh, coming up to 8 o'clock on this Wednesday morning, it is the 17th of April. This is Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster with you all the way until half past nine. Nigel Farage hits out at a cancel culture in Brussels after a police attempt to shut down what is called the National Conservatism Conference. UK inflation fell by less than expected to 3.2% in March. Inflation is still high, the numbers are sticky. What will the Bank of England do when it comes to interest rates? And what does this inflation news mean for you and your family? The Prime Minister suffers a backlash within his own party as key leadership contenders snub his smoking ban. And in the sport, well, it begins and ends with Paris Champions League. We start and end with Paris. Last night, Paris Saint-Germain came from behind to beat Barcelona as Dortmund did the same to Atletico Madrid. Arsenal head to Bayern Munich tonight. That's all level at 2-2 as Manchester City play Real Madrid at the Etihad, which is currently 3-3. And it is 100 days to the Olympic Games. The torch has been lit and he's currently travelling somewhere through Greece. A gusty wind again across the east with a few showers. There will be a bit of rain in the west, particularly for Northern Ireland. But for many, it's going to be a fine and a bright day just on the fresh side. Join me later for all the details. Uh, OK, let's begin with this National Conservatism Conference. Controversy continuing to plague it. It's taking place, well, it's not taking place now, in Brussels uh, after attempts are made to shut it down yesterday. So the local mayor, Emir Keir, who opposed the conference, claims he issued the order to police to ensure public security. Nigel Farage was there. He was speaking at the uh, particular time when the police started to arrive and uh, tried to shut it down. Here's what he had to say. The police are outside the door as I speak. They will not let anybody else in. There are three police there. They have an order to close down this event. And when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do, it's the events here in Brussels today. Well, the move to shut it down was labelled unacceptable by the Belgian Prime Minister and a UK government source told GB News. It's unclear exactly what's happened here, but the scenes will worry anyone who values and believes in free speech. Free society should be confident enough to allow free debate. However, Labour was quick to point to the calibre of attendees. Uh, they included Suela Braverman and Hungary's Prime Minister. I think some of the speakers, from what I understand, who have been advertised on the website for this conference have very unsavoury views. I'm rather surprised that Suella Braverman has been allowed to go and speak at this event. Why is Rishi Sunak not getting a grip of this situation? Why is he not asking Suella Braverman to pull out of this event? Because some of the characters involved, at least according to their website, have made all kinds of comments which I don't think the Rishi Sunak's Tory party would want to associate themselves with. Involved for us, GB News reporter Charlie Peters. Charlie, there you are, the morning after the, the night before. So nothing will happen there today? Mm -hmm. Well, overnight, there has been a legal victory for the organisers of this conference because 
the highest court, the public administration court in Belgium, has suspended that order from the district mayor here after he ordered the police to shut down the event due to supposed public safety concerns. It has been suspended due to suspected illegality in the order that was uh, announced at 2 a.m. this morning. So the conference is anticipated to go ahead today as planned. But that chaos yesterday has already attracted significant amount of attention, as you've described, uh, a small diplomatic row, in effect, with the Hungarian prime minister scheduled to speak today. But the organisers here are keen to kick on with the event, and they've now also noted that the police are protecting the event rather than shutting it down. I'm also joined now by Frank Ferreira, director of MCC Brussels, one of the think tanks organising the event. Frank, what is your reaction to what happened yesterday? Well, it's unbelievable. You know, yesterday, it was a bit like living in totalitarian Russia, the police coming in, marching into the middle of the meeting and telling us that uh, the meeting cannot go ahead. And I asked them why. It's because we were told to do this. And uh, today, uh, we wake up in a, the news that actually the courts in Belgium finally realized that freedom is not just another word, that at the end of the day, in a democratic society, you got to tolerate different points of view. And it seems to me that that's a big, big victory for us because it shows us that the number of socialist mayors in Brussels who tried to shut us down were behaving in an extraordinary authoritarian manner and tearing up the rule book. So, yes, I mean, I'm excited. I'm over the moon because the conference is going ahead and it's a major victory for freedom. There's a big meeting of Eurocrats at the moment in Brussels, and we did hear Nigel Farage saying that what happened yesterday convinced him more than anything that Brexit was the right choice. Have you heard similar sort of statements made by others attending this conference? Well, you know, a lot of people are very jealous. And they're ambiguous because Britain was the only country in the old European Union that actually stood up for freedom, that refused to go down the Federalist route. And since Britain has left, the anti-federalists, the people who want Europe to be more uh, a Europe of nations, have been weakened tremendously. And when they saw Farage speak and, and, and make his views uh, very, very clear, a lot of people felt that a tinge of jealousy, that uh, Britain's been able to go its own way, and maybe it would not be a bad thing if their own society in Italy or France, Holland, elsewhere, could go down a similar path. Did you ever anticipate that this event would be facing the level of censorship and attempted shutdowns as it has? Never. You know, I'm a, a really old guy. I've never been cancelled. This is the first time that they try to cancel me. But the amount of hatred that the local media, that the, the local uh, political elites had towards us actually scared me because, you know, there used to be a time when political differences were between opponents. Now they seem to think that political differences are between enemies. And when you are regarded as an enemy, they will use any means at their disposal to destroy you, to prevent you from opening your mouth, to almost put a quarantine around you to ensure that you stay silent. And we also heard yesterday some reaction from those involved in the conference that this was something of a tin pot dictatorship. Why do you think that this local mayor made that move? I think that uh, Brussels is a, an extremely unpleasant place from the standpoint of, of local governments. You have a number of different uh, mayors who are extremely woke or extremely uh, and, uh, illiberal in their, uh, in their outlook. This particular mayor uh, is, is not a socialist like the other ones. This particular mayor uh, has got very strong uh, Turkish nationalist affiliations. He used to belong to the Grey Wolves movement, which is a, an extreme nationalist movement over there. And uh, what, what has happened, in a sense, is that he regards, he wants to demonstrate to his people that he is as much against open, you know, sort of conservative, clear views as, as, as his socialist colleagues. So it's a, it came as a surprise to me that he did this. But the really good thing was, and this should be, the story should be told, is that the guy who runs this place is of a Tunisian origin said to me that I believe in free speech and I will back you and I will support you. And he is really responsible for the fact that we were able to keep the police out yesterday from our meeting. Thank you, Frank. So the police were kept out of the meeting yesterday thanks to a Tunisian businessman here who believes in free speech. We'll wait for the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, who'll be speaking in the next couple of hours as this conference vows to go on.
gosh. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for bringing us right up to date. So it will go ahead again mm. today. There we go. The time, eight minutes past eight. Uh, let's uh, focus on issues at home now. The Office for National Statistics has released their monthly inflation data. It looks like good news on the surface, a drop uh, to 3.2% in March, a fall from 3.4% in February, but not quite That's as nothing. big a drop as we That's were hoping nothing. for. Something, not even a sneeze. Well, so it it's is. in the right direction. <laughs> Liam Halligan. Good morning, Liam. Morning, uh, He explains uh, how significant is this. I mean, Isabel's right when she said it's in the, the right direction, but it isn't a lot in the right direction, is it? It is in the right direction, but this fall in inflation, whatever the Chancellor says, I'm afraid, it is smaller mm -hmm. than expected. Financial markets were expecting a bigger drop, uh, a greater easing, if you like, of the price pressures, which households and firms across the country now So the have big been question is, for... why not? Why did that not happen? Well, that didn't happen, I think, because we've got a sharp rise in oil prices in recent months, very much driven by geopolitical fears, unrest in the Middle East, ongoing hostilities, of course, even escalating hostilities between Russia and Ukraine. And it's the pesky price of fuel that's keeping inflation higher than we thought it would be, not only here, but in the US as well. And there's a real sense now that interest rates, which were meant to be cut this spring and summer, those rate cuts may take a little bit longer to come through. Let me just take you through the headline numbers because um, we reported them an hour ago, didn't we? But people are just getting up and mm. having their morning coffee, getting their head around what's actually happening. I know I am. So <laughs> inflation, the consumer price index, uh, it was up 3.2% during the year to March. That means prices in March, on average, were 3.2% higher than in March 2023. Yeah, I mean, that's still worth remembering, isn't it? Yeah, they're yeah. not coming Things down, are still they're on just the going up yeah. by less. Though that inflation during the year to March was, was down from inflation of 3.4% during the year to February. And, you know, as recently as October 2022, inflation was up at 11%. So there has been a big fall. Mm. This is the lowest figure since September 2021. That's what the Chancellor is referring to. But the March inflation number was still higher than expected. And that's why when the Bank of England meets the next time, the Monetary Policy Committee on May the 9th, there is no way they're going to cut interest rates in May and probably not in June either. Whereas, you know, a few weeks ago, I'd have said yeah. they probably would cut yeah. in June. We're now looking, I think, in July or August mm. for the first cut in interest rates. Great news if you've got savings and you live off the interest of those savings, as many pensioners do, mm. uh, but not such good news if you're a young family mm. trying to remortgage, trying to renegotiate a new home loan. Mm. You've got other debts on cars, mm. utilities, you know, mm. your white goods, uh, kitchen appliances and so on. And that's why these higher borrowing costs squeeze not just household finances, but Companies' finances too. Anyone that's running a small business may may have debt yeah, on their books. Yeah. They have to pay yeah, those interest yeah. payments. Those interest payments aren't going to come down anytime soon, and that is a blow. But when they do come down, if they do come down, so you could be talking about August, September, October. You could be talking about the run up to a general mm -hmm. election. So that could be very beneficial for Mr. Sunak. It could, Eamon, but the Tories, to the extent to which they've had an election strategy in the last six months, the strategy has been to go long, to wait for the economy to pick up, to wait for Tory tax cuts to take effect uh, as they want them to. We had a tax cut in January on national insurance. We had another one coming in, the, which came in at the beginning of this month. Uh, we know that Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, wants to hold another budget in September, October, maybe a third tax mm -hmm. cut. But even more important than tax cuts in terms of rejuvenating the economy and getting this feel-good factor going, which may... It's not going to mean the Tories are going to win the election. It means they may have a better chance of contesting the election uh, and, in the, the words of many Tories that I talk to, limiting the losses to the extent mm -hmm. that they can. But it's the interest rate reductions that are the most important mm. thing, more important than the tax cuts. So, in many ways... The, 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 if you like, the Tories' election strategy is in the hands of unelected economists at the Bank of England, and unelected economists at the Bank of England are going to look at these inflation numbers and think, nah, we're not cutting interest rates any time soon. Well, what we're going to do now, Liam, is we're going to Theo Chikomba, and he's out and about. He's in Edenbridge in Kent. And uh, tell us why, why you're there and, and, and reaction that you're getting, Theo. Good morning. I'm outside. <laughs> the sun's going to be out. <laughs> 
Uh, did you hear that, Theo? Sorry, you, you, I know you're outside. That's why we're throwing to you. You're in Eden Bridge. Sorry, I don't think you heard me. I still don't think he's hearing me. No, no, oh, no. Oh, dear. No, no, no. And a few issues with our transmission mm. there. Um, but we can, we can pick up and have a few more words with, with um, Liam Halligan because we've heard from the Chancellor this morning and he's come out predictably. I mean, I could almost write it in advance. This is proof the plan's working, inflation's coming down, we're sticking to the plan. Um, but if you look at some of the other economic figures that have come out in the last few days, just yesterday we heard about the number of inactive Brits, economically inactive, uh, increasing. One in five people not contributing anything to the economy and the rate of unemployment going up as well, they've got to be really tearing their hair out in the Treasury that this, A, inflation's not coming down more quickly, and B, the growth isn't appearing. We aren't, you know, contributing more to the economy. Uh, we can't get people back to work. Yeah, there are lots of conflicting pressures. Um, you know, growth is pretty lacklustre here in the UK. It's roughly average for the other large Western economies, but it's certainly a lot slower than we want it to be. If the pie isn't getting bigger, mm. uh, it makes politics much more combative, much more um, uh, uh, conducted in, 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 in a less gracious way. It becomes spikier, doesn't it, if, if the fight over money is more intense because there's less money, because there's less growth. And overnight, we've had the governor of the Federal Reserve, the US central bank, the most important central bank in the world, Jay Powell. And he has been saying, uh, as some of us have been predicting for a long time, that because mm. of high energy prices, because of geopolitical risk, mm. the Fed isn't going to be able to cut rates any time soon. So I always soon. thought America was quite insulated from that. Absolutely. They have their own energy, and that's why that they're... No, no, they, they, they have, but they've also got quite a lot of inflation, right. Isabel. Inflation in the US went up mm. in March from 3.2% to 3.5%, mm. in the wrong direction, mm. because their economy is on a different cycle to us now. They're growing by two and a half, three percent. Right. We're growing by, you know, around half a percent. Mm. So certainly in America, they're going to be more worried about inflation. And the reality is, where America goes, the rest of the world, or certainly the Western world, tends to follow. So and until the US Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, starts to cut rates, signalling that the global interest rate cycle mm. has now turned mm. and we're going to have the momentum in the other direction for a few years, I can't see the Act Bank of England acting before the Fed acts. Liam, Thank cheers. Everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for keeping us up to date. More from Liam before the end of the programme. The Rwanda plan has been dealt a series of defeats in the House of Lords, further delaying passage of the bill through Parliament. Despite MPs in the Commons overturning previous changes by the House of Lords, peers again pressed demands for revisions to the bill. Uh, the government's smoking ban bill has exposed a rift within the Conservative Party after passing through the Commons yesterday. Nearly half of all Tory MPs, including five leadership hopefuls and members of the Cabinet, failed to support the Prime Minister's flagship deal. EasyJet has suspended flights to Tel Aviv for the next six months following more uncertainty in Israel. Flights will be halted until the 27th of October. Customers, though, if you have booked, you will be offered a full refund. And take a look at these pictures. If you're listening on the radio, uh, check them out when you get a chance to. Torrential rain and flooding in Dubai has caused uh, lots of problems for the city as authorities there have been urged to uh, have urged people to stay home. Uh, these videos are showing cars and streets swamped in water. Dubai Airport said operations were temporarily diverted, though they have since restarted. But it's a popular destination with lots of British people. And I wonder if you are watching or listening to this and, and you were caught up in this. Let us know your story this now, morning. Apparently we hear that this was deliberate caused the clouds were seeded mm. and uh, and then that makes them rain and obviously Dubai is a, a desert mm. uh, it is flat and um, and that's the the result there was that mm. what they intended yeah. what are they going to do with all that water exactly big problems advice no shortage of water here. No, <laughs> but there's not. About but, rain. But Isabelli, there will be <laughs> come the summer. There will no, I know. Be these, it's exactly the same. These inefficient, inadequate utility mm. companies will suddenly say, oh. Hose pipe ban. Don't you go out there with your hose pipe? 
don't be doing that. And, um, and the thing is, it's not our fault, it's their no, fault, right. because they don't dig holes in the ground and keep the water. And uh, I, I, can, I can just see this. I mean, the rain, I, I don't remember the rain being as heavy as this this, this whole year. It's, it's been, been a very wet year, for sure. And yesterday, it was everything. I mean, we had gorgeous sunshine, then torrential rain. We even had hailstones that were yeah. bouncing off the lawn. It looked like popcorn exploding yes. in the microwave. It was, it was it does, exciting it weather yesterday. It doesn't come yesterday. across as misery rain or whatever. It is torrential, it's, as you yeah. say, sterols. Yeah, it, absolutely. Totally it's a sort of, that sort of rain that makes you wet. Yes, kind of biblical. <laughs> Alex Deacon with the forecast. Anyway. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures, pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and Northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, uh, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland, uh, increasingly blustery here as well. But further south, the winds will be light. Yes, it'll cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine, we should again and get up to 13 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Now there's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies and... £10,000 and it's not taxed at all, so you get £10,000. That makes a change. <laughs> but the only thing that isn't taxed, yeah. here are your details. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck birthday it is today? No. Who? It's Posh Spice's birthday. Oh, Drew right. Beckham, guess how old? Tell me how old. Guess. How really, really old. Guess. Um, well, she's, um, she's, um, she, she's got to be around 50. Yeah, it's her 50th birthday. Right. Guess how many years she's been married to Bex? Well, so what? Uh, 24. Uh, 20, 20, That's something. a long time. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. That's the only bit of the sport that I'm really interested in. The rest is over to you. <laughs> OK, there'll be Champions League, there'll be Olympic stuff, and there'll be Paul Coit all right. Oh, I like that bit. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel.
This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Squatters in London have taken over a pub which is leased by Gordon Ramsay, no less. The pub is currently up for sale with a guide price of £30 million. Um, it is understood that Kitchen Nightmares host Ramsay called the police on Wednesday but was unable to have the squatters removed. The Metropolitan Police said in a statement they were made aware of squatters at a disused property but added, this is a civil matter and so police did not attend the property. Let's see what my panel make of this. Why can't we just boot squatters out? If we own a property or lease a property, why can't we just boot them out? I know that's tempting, but the fact yeah. is, long-term empty properties have increased by 24% in the last six years. There's 1.2 million people on the social housing lists. People don't have a place to live. What it does highlight is the enormous... Um, disparity in fairness in property laws in this country. I mean, it's just not fair that if you've worked all your life and invested some money in property because, you know, interest rates at zero and there's nowhere else to invest your money, and then suddenly somebody who's got no claim to that property and doesn't seem to have earned very much in life takes over your property. It's an outrage. People shouldn't be squatting in people's, other people's homes or, or restaurants. commercial properties. But the fact is... Until we sort the housing problem in this country, none of this is going to go away. The, the fact is, people my age yeah. won't be able to buy a home unless they've got a bung from their parents. Yeah, but what's the practicality uh, uh, of this demonstration? It, it, uh, it's it, not a demonstration. It's not going to free I mean, up more housing for people who are no, on the streets, No, of course not. It? It's people looking to find a place to live. I don't think it's a demonstration at it, all. It, it, it's an anti-wealth, anti-property owning demonstration by people who've got nothing better to do in life than uh, <laughs> break into other people's property. <laughs> Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. What really, you know, makes you appreciate your colleagues is when they give you gifts. You could learn a lot. I just got given this chocolate lolly. It says top banana on it. That's made my day. I can't Why even tell you. Why didn't you just have a banana instead? Well, that would be healthier, but, you know, I think there's a message there. So is it, is it banana flavoured? I don't know, actually. I wasn't actually going to eat it because <laughs> it's chocolate. But I'm just so grateful for the thought from a colleague. I think that's really nice. Wait a minute. You're oh, not, all right, I'll eat it. You're not going to eat it. <laughs> I was going to try and be healthy. Um, oh. Yeah, I can't, can't divulge she gave it to me, but that was really nice. Top, top banana, it says. Top banana. There we go. Uh, another top banana. Yeah. Cost me three quid, that <laughs> jalali <with> that. <laughs> <laughs> No. It was her boss, Mick Booker, got Oh, he named it. There you go. <laughs> uh, right, Paul. So, first of all, look, Champions League yes, last sir. night and again tonight. Um, how did you read it? How did I you know think it's it good. But this is when it starts getting exciting because we're getting to the knockout stage now. The two legs. So the yeah. last one, uh, we, well, Barcelona versus PSG, which was yesterday. Barcelona went 1-0 up. They're at home playing PSG. They were ahead anyway. So that put them two up. And then there was a sending off. And then things started to turn. So PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, scored four in the end. Two for Kylian Mbappe. Very good. Are they keeping Mbappe? There, there no, was... no, he's going to go to Real Madrid. He's not going to stick around. Oh, right, right Yeah, right, yeah, right, he's, right. that's where he's going to be going. So it ended up 6-4 in aggregate. Borussia Dortmund came back against Atletico Madrid, which means that they're through. So it's a Borussia Dortmund, Paris Saint-Germain semi-final. The other semi-final, now that's tonight, we've got the quarter-finals, and this is when things are getting exciting because we've got Arsenal, who are off to Bayern Munich, currently 2-2. Harry Kane, of course, playing for Bayern Munich. You see, they want to score against Arsenal. They're the team that let him go when he was nine years old. Said the yeah. kid's never going to make it. Yeah. It worked out okay for him. In the well, end. they lost to the weekend to Villa as well, didn't they? That's they did. The they did. Yeah. And um, and it's just whether you know it's people love to throw this thing around. All oh, their bottlers and are they going to be able to? This is going to be the ultimate yeah. test to go over to Germany. If they can mm. beat Germ, if they can beat the Germans by Munich, you but, know. But they City, get City, a City. car crash, weren't they? In the last couple of days, Harry Kane's kids. So I wonder if that might put him off his game.
nothing. I only never know about the sports stories when it relates to... Focused. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Harry's, Harry's so focused. Yeah. And, and also says that, you know, there will be Spurs fans. I, I would never know, I would not know, that may want him to do particularly well against Arsenal. OK. But uh, um, he always scores against them. Do, do you... What, what chance do you think City stand in Spain, in Madrid? Well, it's at the Etihad. This one's, this one's at home, so right. I, think, I think they're going to well, be... you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, isn't it? Is it this one? Yeah, yeah, it's at the Etihad. So this one is... It's currently 3-3. Three, well, three. So, so they, the, the best result was in Madrid then. Very interesting. Absolutely. So mm. I think... You know, it's, this could... I hate to use these sort of things, but it could go either way. So oh, I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah, I'm. Th I'm thinking. No, uh, I'm thinking. I, th I think City will go through because they're the holders, yeah. of course. But we'll have to see. Uh, we 100 see. days until the Paris Olympics. Oh yes. And uh, never really. Thought, there wasn't thinking much of them, Paul. But you're getting me excited. I, oh, I love to get excited yeah, about these. Yeah. It's 100 days to go. I'm so, counting them off. I've got a calendar. Everybody. So they lit the <laughs> torch have, yesterday. They lit the torch yesterday. They're supposed to. It's supposed to be the sun. It's the sun above Greece, which lights the torch, which sets the Olympic flame going. This is what happened. Have a look at this. It's very moving. It's a very lovely ceremony that they do every year, and it's Greek actress Mary Mina. You're yeah. familiar with the work of Mary? There's Mary. They're lighting the torch. You've got to be careful. You think she'd have oven gloves on. That's a metal bowl there. Yeah, they yeah. get very, very hot. You've got some green. Uh -huh. Obviously, with everybody that. around, there's, there's lots of, you know, people in the background there <laughs> making it a very lovely ceremony. Now, she will then pass it over to Stephanus Suskos, who is a, he's a Greek champion rower and by the way he runs you can tell he probably is a rower and not a runner so he's going to start it off and then they're going off around greece and then it goes around france he goes to all the french territories uh, and then we'll arrive in paris on july the 26th now have a look at this this is what happened in russia so this is a warning to everybody in greece and in france look see his flame's gone out the flame's gone out so we've got to light it and look what's he using to light it just uh, use my cigarette lighter, lighter is yeah, it? Yeah, just yeah. use that. This, yeah, don't everybody yeah. look the other way. So Ooh. there we are. There's the Olympic flame all the way from Greece. That was singed your eyebrows. Lighter, and then off he goes again. Very good. Well, off you go again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. My flame will burn brightly. Well, for the rest well of the because day, because Nigel oh. Farage's flame is burning more brightly than <laughs> yours. <laughs> and uh, so we've got Nigel. Where is Nigel? Oh, He's in Brussels not for us, and he has some breaking news in relation to that National Conservative Conference. Uh, you had a hell of a day yesterday, Mr Farage, but uh, what can you tell us this morning about the rest of your conference? Well, the police had this instruction to close the conference down, and indeed, whilst I was on stage, they came in with this document. Uh, but there were only three police officers and a huge number of people, and they also saw cameras from all over the world, and they sort of bottled out. Uh, we wondered whether today's conference would go ahead, uh, but overnight, it is going ahead. The Prime Minister of Belgium has intervened to say what happened yesterday was wrong, as indeed did Rishi Sunak and the Prime Minister of Italy, Georgia Maloney, as well. Um, you know, this is a very deeply intolerant place. If you come to Brussels with a different point of view, if you question the whole project of European Union, they literally try to shut you down. And I think what happened yesterday was a massive own goal. I wanted to, to, to challenge you on that a little bit because um, you've just listed a number of European leaders who have criticised the actions yesterday and then in the same breath said that this was yeah. um, all about you being anti-EU. But as my understanding is, there were concerns, mm. rightly or wrongly, to be debated depending on people's persuasions, that who you were sharing a platform with were potentially going to cause public disorder. Somebody like Viktor Orban, who I think is speaking today, wow. somebody who's <coughs> been accused in Hungary, where he's president, of shutting down dissent journalists, politicians who don't share his own opinion, uh, and a close ally of Putin as well. Hang on a second. Viktor Orban is the most successful politician in Europe. He repeatedly gets re-elected at general elections in a multi-party system with over 50 per cent of the vote. People may not like his politics, but he is a legitimate leader. Mm. Uh, and the idea, the idea that a prime minister of a country should not be allowed to come to Brussels and speak on a platform, uh, frankly, the very concept is monstrous. And what about the point about the EU? Because you were saying a moment ago that this was, you know, an example mm. of, of why you're glad that, that we've left and that Brexit is a good thing. I mean, this wasn't about the EU, though, was it, really? 
the whole conference was a coming together of Eurosceptic groups who question the globalist structure that is the European mm. Union. We've got European elections coming in just a few weeks' time, mm. and it looks like passes, UKIP-style passes, mm -hmm. are going to top the poll in nine or ten European countries. This was getting ready for the European elections, and I came here you know, formally as a group leader in the European Parliament to encourage them all. Mm -hmm. And I think they can now go back to their countries and say, look, see how deeply intolerant the European project is. See how fundamentally anti-democratic it is. Mm -hmm. And I think what yesterday did is going to be a huge boost to those parties in June. Yeah, and free speech obviously needs to be protected. Labour have come out today um, mm. really criticising the Prime Minister for allowing members of the Conservative Party, like Suella Braverman, who was until recently um, home secretary, Secretary. I mean, is that a fair point, or should people within the party be entitled to go and speak uh, and give their views wherever they want? Well, of course they should, and you know, members of the Labour Party attend conferences all over the world. The fact that we've seen these comments from the Labour Party actually worries me because it's 99% certain, according to Sir John Curtis, that Keir Starmer is going to be in power after the next election. So are we going to see a British Labour government that clamps down on free speech? It looks like the Labour Party have sided with the mayors in Brussels who, who now have closed down two venues, attempted to close down a third. Uh, yeah, I'm really worried. If that's the direction Labour are going in, it's very concerning. Yeah. Tell us about the mayor in Brussels, yeah. Nigel, um, and, and where he comes from. And he's, um, he, was, he was worried about the threat of violence yesterday. Did, did there look as if there was going to be any violence where you were when you were speaking? So Brussels has a series of local mayors. Um, the first venue we had was cancelled after pressure from the local mayor. The second venue we had was cancelled after pressure from the local mayor. The third venue, what happened was the Tunisian businessman who owned the establishment said to the local mayor, go to hell. You know, yeah. these people are entitled to come, speak freely, behave. And as for any violence, um, Eamon, I can tell you, in the room, you know, we had uh, members of European royal families, we had distinguished academics, we had businessmen, businesswomen. I mean, this was, this actually was quite an intellectual yeah. gathering of people. Um, I can't think of a more peaceful group of people yeah. to be in a room with. The whole thing was a nonsense. They wanted to shut down free speech. They tried, but I'm pleased to say we've won. And I'm heading off to the conference again now. Okay. The conference will continue. Right, we will let you do that. Thanks, Nigel. Thank Thanks you. for keeping appreciate us up to date. It. Really appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the time now, 25 to 9. Up next... We are getting ready to spice up your life. <laughs> Sorry, I can't say that without singing it. I really love the Spice Girls. I'm that age. Anyway, she's a little bit older than me. It's Victoria Beckham's birthday. You'll never guess how old she is today. We'll be telling you all about it in just a moment. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. The M1 in Northamptonshire is partly blocked northbound. There's some kind of problem not far off the junction 16, the turn for the A45 and Fort Whedon Road near to Northampton, causing queues. In Merthyr Tidville, the A465, the head to the Valleys Road, is closed eastbound from the Pullis Top Roundabout to the A469 at the Rimney Interchange because of animals on the road. Westbound, though, has reopened. In Wiltshire, there are queues on the A419 southbound between the White Hart Roundabout and common head interchange at Swindon after an accident. London Overground services aren't running between Highbury and Islington and Stratford with severe delays between Highbury and Islington and both Richmond and Clapham Junction because of a faulty train. And in West Sussex, the A23 is partly blocked southbound by an accident at Hand Cross causing delays. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. On this, her birthday, on this, what day it is today, it is the 17th of April, Wednesday, 17th of April, we say happy birthday to Victoria Beckham. Here my she birthday. is. It's my birthday. Oh, my goodness, happy you don't look... Happy birthday to me. Uh, well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you, you I don't know, you, you just don't even look remotely near 50. You're looking really well. <laughs> Well, I'm Camilla, uh, and I was a lookalike for Victoria Beckham for over 20 years. No way. And, and why you still look like her? Why why aren't yeah. you why aren't you still a Victoria Beckham lookalike? Uh, well, life moves on, and you know, I really, really was lucky to have you know been a lookalike for all these years. Um, I, I was lucky enough to resemble her. Um, that I had her look. Um, I was only 18 when I started, and I've been lucky enough to go around the world, experience amazing things, met amazing people, and I've even met Victoria. Is that you? Twice, actually. As, are we looking at real pictures of Victoria or pictures of you? Because it's really hard to tell um, whether this is you or her. They, they are all me. Wow. <laughs> and the many hair, hair cuts and hair changes I had to do over the years. Now, Camilla, you get, by being uh, a lookalike, you got an insight into the sort of attention someone like Victoria would get. Not, not the same as the attention that she would get, but a, but a, you know, a close uh, resemblance of all of that. What was it like? What are people's interest and fascination in Victoria Beckham? Well, definitely. I mean, um, some of it's been a bit overwhelming, actually. I've had a, a real sort of taste of what life must be like for her. Um, people, like, we went to L.A. and they literally believed, because um, I went with the Beckham lookalike as well, and they actually thought we were really her. And we were getting mobbed. We were, we were driving in a car down the street and we had paparazzis chasing us, hanging out the Awful. window. Yeah. And it was pretty scary, actually. Yeah. And, you know, this is something that she deals with daily. And, you know... Well, she gets times. some of the benefits of that as well, doesn't she? I mean, I was reading in the papers this morning um, that she might be spending her birthday in Miami in her $17 million penthouse. So, you know, it comes with a few benefits. Just tell me, yes, did you does. say then... You, I you hope met... I get an invite. You didn't get an invite, and, and I'm presuming your penthouse isn't quite as valuable. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you met David Beckham, and was that weird, knowing that he must fancy you because you look like his wife? I don't think so. I mean, she's <laughs> absolutely beautiful and she's funny. I mean, when I met her, um, she she was just a really lovely lady. She was joking around and, and made me feel really at ease. Um, she's just so friendly. So, did, she, did she offer yeah, you any it advice? Was, it was a lovely experience. Did she offer you any advice about what you were wearing or how you were sounding? Um, well, I've obviously had to master the Victoria Beckham look. You know, so the poses, the pouts, um, 
yeah, I've had to study, you know, a lot of her body language for it to be believable to people. Have you had to eat a, a diet of, um, what is it that she has, salmon and, and steamed vegetables every day for the last <laughs> 25 years? Or are you naturally... Well, I'm naturally quite thin anyway. And I've never well. really been into chocolate and stuff like that. Um, sweets, I like to eat. But, yeah, it's I've, I'm, a, I'm just a slim build, so I'm... Lucky I'm lucky you. in that way. Yeah, you are. Well, Camilla, um, it's it's Victoria's birthday. We wish her all the best um, today. Yes. Uh, will you be joining in in any way? Have you anything else to do today? Will you be marking it in any way? <laughs> well, I would like to wish Victoria the happiest of birthdays today. I mean, she's a beautiful, iconic woman, and I hope she has the best day celebrating with her family and all her loved ones. So, yeah. Happy birthday, Victoria. Well, and uh, happy, happy whatever it is to you today, Camilla. It's uh, been very, very <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Very lovely talking to you. You're an absolute delight. Yes. That's Camilla Eldridge. Thank you for having me on. Uh, she was a former Victoria Beckham lookalike. We say goodbye to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. She could still do it, though, couldn't she? Still looks a spitting image. Um, I wonder if you fell for it for a second. For a moment there, I thought, is it the real... Is it the real Bex or not? Anyway, still to come, uh, we'll be going through the papers this morning. We've got Leon Emerali and Scarlett Maguire for one last look at what is making the news. See you in a moment. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to Michael Asher's former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. I think the cash report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, trans rights campaigners, that there's an awful lot of good in the cash report. I, I think that I'm more concerned about Mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been has done such great work uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights... You said well, two-year-olds you... could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, J.K. Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two-year-old can think that they can be another gender when my four-year-old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense and, and it, to me it's I very... Think it was very badly phrased, it's, very, it's yeah. very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender. And, and unfortunately out there, there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now. And I think this whole... Um, agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender and we have to push back and as I said earlier to be trans is not normal. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree it's with extreme. that phrasing. I think, no, I think it's, it's I extreme. Think it's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, we've got uh, Leona Morali and we've got Scarlett Maguire and they are 
Talking about things that have grabbed their attention news-wise um, today. Um, carers allow allowance, Scarlett. Um, Labour's going to review the system of carers allowance if it wins the next general election. This is something that I just love to see. I love to see people who do this sort of work mm. rewarded, recognised, valued. Which, but do you know how bad it is? Mm. That, that, it's bad. That you're allowed, so a, a carer's allowance is 80 it is £81 uh, a, a week, right? If you earn over £151 a week, you lose it all. So, therefore, carers who save us millions and millions, right, save the whole country millions, are not allowed to earn a decent whack or else they lose it. And what, what's been happening is, is it, it hasn't been completely clear... And so some of them are paying back thousands and thousands yeah. of pounds and, and, and are heavily in debt. And, and instead, we should be saying thank you. I know. Thank you. I mean, This is like the new post office scandal, it seems to me. I mean, these are people that might have made really minor errors in, yeah. um, in accounting here and being heavily pursued, even getting criminal records as a result um, in some cases. I mean, this is a no-brainer, isn't it, Leon? Massively a no-brainer. And I just think that this is one of those stories where it saves the taxpayer loads of money. The fact that carers are, are caring for family members and we're not having to, to, you know, ship it out elsewhere. I think we should be looking at these people, holding them in, in much higher regard um, and not ho holding them over the coals because, as you say, it's been a, a minor mistake. It's one of those miscarriages of justice, I think, that is going to get people quite riled. Mm. Um, we were talking earlier um, uh, about Nike, the sportswear firm, and uh, they, they designed the American Olympic kit... Uh, which was quite revealing. Mm. Uh, but the boss, the, the, their sales are on a bit of a downturn, Leon, mm. and the boss has said this is to do with what? This is to do with people at Nike not being creative enough because they're all working from home. They're all doing their brainstorming or whatever it is via Zoom and it's just not coming up with the same types of bold, disruptive products that Nike are known for. So um, I think there's a point to it because you can't necessarily be particularly creative when you're just staring at a computer monitor rather than actually being in a room with someone, getting heads together uh, and being able to have a good old chit chat and coming up with ideas that, that actually inspire people. So maybe the Nike, Nike CEO, John Donohoe, has got a point. Get back in the office to be more creative. Have any of you seen the film Air that came out last year I starring really um, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck? It's brilliant. Mm. It's absolutely brilliant. And it talks about how they came up with the Michael Jordan trainer and the creativity involved. And it, he went out on a limb. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I wonder what he'd have to say about everything today and, and lack of creativity from working from home. Yeah. They've ever left the office. I mean, they virtually slept at Nike Town. No, you've got to. And, you know, I, I do a bit of work with, with an advertising agency and, and during the during the lockdown, you've come up with really rubbish work because you're just sort of going through the motions, you're just staring at a computer mm. screen, every day is the same. Whereas you get into an office, you have a laugh, you, you might take a few moments to go for a walk, that's when you get your best ideas. Yeah. So I, I'm with him. Okay. Uh, staying with Sports Scarlet, Jude Bellingham, English player, playing in the Spanish League, and he talks about, we, we've seen a lot of this in relation to him, that uh, the racism uh, that he has to experience is, is pretty bad, but he says it's so bad you just expect it. Yeah, I mean this this is this is an absolute disgrace, and 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 the uh, so basically, you know, Jude Bellingham go, goes on a fantastic young player yeah. who happens to be black, and so you know they shout at him, they make monkey noises, which used to happen here and actually is now absolutely outlawed here, and that's what they should do it in Spain. And what's so awful is, is there's this young Brazilian player called v Vinicius Jr., I mean, who broke down in tears about what he was dealing with. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, and it's not just Spain, though Spain is appalling Italy's about bad. it. Italy's mm. bad. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the, the, they, they need to do something or else, or else the, the, the black players are going to leave and, and they are incredibly mm. talented. Mm. And you just think, what is going on with yeah. these fans? Well, you know, I have to say, thankfully, in all the years I've been going to English League football, I've never once heard a racial abuse. I might not be sensitive to it and, and therefore... But what I'm trying to say is I agree with you. I think that to a degree we haven't got it cracked but mm. we have shown um, intent against it. 
and um, and that has got to be replicated elsewhere. But I, th but, but I think it has really changed. I mean, I remember quite a long time ago when I first met Sadiq Khan, long before he was mayor, and he's a real football fan, and he, he it, it was um, when there was the European Cup and it was being held in Holland and, and uh, Belgium, and he... He got tickets. He would not go to an England game because he just, just said right. he just was not was not prepared for the racial abuse. Mm. And I do think that's really, really changed. So mm. the racial abuse that would be going to the players on the pitch or towards him? Towards in the him. <sighs> towards him. Yeah. Um, can we squeeze in a quick chat before we wrap things up, Leon, about Taylor Swift? Um, lots of Swifties, yeah. Taylor Swift fans, have been scammed to the tune of how much? How more than a million pounds has been lost to fraudsters who have basically been selling either fake Taylor Swift tickets or they've just been taking people's bank details uh, and, and fooling these, these poor Taylor Swift fans. And I think that's a disgusting story mm. because a lot of them will be young kids, mm -hmm. young people who've saved up their pocket money, whatever it might be, to go and see her, and yet they're being scammed for. It. And, uh, you know, I think Taylor Swift's brilliant uh, and I think she's a fantastic artist, but sometimes that sort of passion when you love someone so much, it, it, as a fan, you don't necessarily check the details and people should be. But, Leon, these, uh, these tickets, uh, just generally on sale, they go so quickly and they're only available through agencies. I know. And the markup that agencies charge is absolutely... Mm. Unbelievable! You just would not believe how many times the, the ticket prices multiply. Mm. I know. Well, I was looking for an artist that I like. Um, I was looking at tickets, seven hundred quid they were. Yeah. Found one for thirty quid. Bought it. Turns out it was a uh, a lookalike. Turns out it was a yeah, tribute. I mean, a tribute Leon, act. Yeah. How did you fall for that? I don't know, but it's in Northern <laughs> Ireland, Damon. The of the it's year. It's in Northern Ireland, so we're going and oh. we're going to have a great time. You but are, I did think it's going to be. going to see who? Luke Combs. He's a country artist. Right. Um, yeah. And it's a Luke Combs lookalike. It's a Luke Combs. <laughs> We're going for like 700 quid. I saw one for 30 quid. I thought, what a bargain. We're going to go for that. Bought it. And then turns but out it was know, a but tribute. You know act. the rule. If it looks as though it's, it's too, too good, good to be true, true. I know. it is I too good, good to be true. true. I know. I know. Should have learned. <laughs> so you're a country fan? I love country I music. Love country. Oh, yeah. me too. Love fantastic. Love I was in Nashville. Beyonce? I'm not with that. Oh. I, I, I think oh. Beyonce is not a country artist, and there are a lot. Now. No. There are a lot of women um, country artists who are being sidelined because Beyonce is no. getting involved. Oh. Guys, got to say goodbye to you. Thank you both very, very Thank much you. indeed. Very Thank enjoyable. You. Uh, your weather, I think, will be less enjoyable. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair few showers, and it is going to turn damp in Northern Ireland. A dry start, but the cloud and rain is steadily pushing in from the north. We'll have showers across northeast Scotland through the day, and some will graze these eastern counties of England, where there's a, a pretty chilly and brisk wind blowing along those North Sea coasts. One or two scattered showers elsewhere and a bit more cloud coming into West Wales later. But as I said, for many, dry and bright. Uh, it isn't warm, though. It's chilly out there this morning and temperatures struggling, maybe in the teens in London, but six or seven degrees for most of the day in Northern Ireland. That's going to feel pretty chilly. Some of that rain from Northern Ireland will get into parts of South Wales and southwest England this evening, so it's turning a little damp here. Still a few showers through the night across East Anglia and parts of Kent and the far north of Scotland. But for most, it's a dry night, a clear night. Pretty chilly one again, temperatures well down into single figures. Pockets of frost likely for Wales, the Midlands and northern England, certainly in rural areas. Uh, we will see quite a bit of sunshine on Thursday morning across the southern half of the UK, but clouding over through the night and for the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland and further outbreaks of rain pushing in here. Quite a, a, quite a wet day actually for Western Scotland. Uh, increasingly blustery here as well. But further south, the winds will be light. Yes, it'll cloud over a little bit, but uh, with some sunshine, we should again get up to 13 degrees. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Merthyr Tydfil. The A465 head to the Valleys Road is closed eastbound from the Dice Top Roundabout to the A469 at the Rimney Interchange because of animals on the road causing queues. On the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lanes closed southbound for emergency barrier repairs at St Melons. It's repair damage caused by an accident earlier. In Wiltshire, there are southbound queues on the A419 after an accident between the White Hart Roundabout and Common Head Interchange at Swindon. In London, there are long delays each way on the A2. It's a roadway 
works at Blackheath Hill. Trains have been stopped between Upfield and East Croydon for track safety checks. In West Sussex, the A23 has blocked southbound where a vehicle caught fire at Hand Cross with queues from Pease Pottage. And on the M27 in Hampshire, there's a lane closed westbound. Someone's broken down at Junction 8 at Bursledon, causing queues. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's nine o'clock, it's Wednesday the 17th of April and you're very welcome to the programme. Welcome aboard, breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Nigel Farage hits out at Council Culture in Brussels after police attempt to shut down the National Conservatism Conference. Free speech prevails in Brussels. The NatCon conference is on after a court in Belgium strikes down an order to shutter this conference. UK inflation has fallen less than expected to 3.2% in March. We'll be speaking to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott, about it shortly. Prime Minister suffered a Conservative backlash as key leadership contenders snub his smoking ban. A gusty wind again across the east with a few showers. There will be a bit of rain in the west, particularly for Northern Ireland. But for many, it's going to be a fine and a bright day just on the fresh side. Join me later for all the details. Well, it was a dramatic day yesterday. Controversy continuing to plague the National Conservatism Conference in Brussels. Attempts were made to shut down the event uh, in the city. Uh, the mayor of Brussels, Amir Kerr, who opposed the conference, claims he issued the order to police because he wanted to ensure public security, which Nigel Farage uh, didn't agree with when we spoke to him just a short time ago on the programme. Yes, he was speaking at the event as the police arrived and attempted to shut it down. The police are outside the door as I speak. They will not let anybody else in. There are three police there. They have an order to close down this event. And when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do, it's the events here in Brussels today. 
Well, the move to shut it down was labelled unacceptable by the Prime Minister of Belgium, as well as the UK government, who told GB News. Uh, it's unclear what happened here, but the scenes will worry anyone who believes in free speech. Free society should be confident enough to allow debate. Uh, Labour, quick to point to the calibre of attendees. Earlier we spoke with Shadow Education Minister Catherine McKinnell. I think Rishi Sunak has some questions to answer about his own MPs and, and who they're associating with. And obviously, you know, that there, there are issues of freedom of speech, freedom of association, all of that Labour absolutely supports. But you've got to question whether Rishi Sunak, as the Prime Minister, should be comfortable with his MP, Suella Braverman, who was down to speak and share a platform with some highly divisive figures. Well, let's speak now to our reporter, Charlie Peters, who is there in Brussels. Um, you can bring us up to date, Charlie, on this developing story and tell us who is expected to take the stage and why that is raising some eyebrows for Labour. Well, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, is set to speak here in the next hour. He's a controversial figure across the continent, very much not welcome in Brussels. He is a political opponent of the EU. And so... In many cases, it was not much of a surprise that there was such a big pushback to this conference when it started yesterday. This is, in fact, the third venue they've picked after two others were shut down from political and local pressure. The district mayor who shut down this event yesterday, uh, people who are organising NatCon have pointed out that he actually was kicked out of the Socialist Party in Brussels due to his own links to the far-right ultra-nationalists in Turkey. So a very controversial set of circumstances here. But at 2 a.m., the organisers were able to announce that they'd actually appealed against the order from that district mayor here in Brussels. They'd gone to the highest court for public administration in Belgium, which found that the decision to shut down the event based on public safety had to be suspended as it was considered illegal at the moment. Now, obviously, it's been annulled for now. There will be a further process to assess that order. But at the moment, it has been suspended and the police are not anticipated to shut down the event. I've attended some NatCon conferences in the past and organisers I spoke to last night said this is, in comparison, usually their smallest event, the, the event that takes place in Brussels. But after the attempted shutdown yesterday, it's become their biggest in terms of coverage. More people are aware of this conference and those speaking at it now than they ever would have because of those attempts to censor those speaking here today. Now, as they gather for this conference, there are anticipated potential protests that could be gathering nearby. We saw some 10 or so protesters gathering after the police shut down the event yesterday. But we're now waiting for Victor Orban to come and deliver that keynote address at 11 o'clock. OK, we'll hear from you later, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed. Now, the Office for National Statistics has released its monthly inflation data. Uh, prices rising across the country 3.2% in March, down from 3.4% in February. Yeah, not quite as big a drop as many were hoping to see. Let's get the thoughts of our East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis. And Will, I believe you're with a fishmonger this morning who can give his perspective on what this means for his business and indeed his customers. Yes, well, it's good news that inflation is now lower, but it's important to remember that inflation doesn't mean that prices are going to come down. It just means that they're going to rise a little bit more slowly. But it's a far cry from was it where it was when it was at the peak in October 2022, 11% inflation. Well, it does affect prices on markets up and down the country, including here in Market Bosworth in Leicestershire, where, Louis, you're the local fishman. You've been we working are. here for 20-odd years. 21 years in Luff. In uh, we've been uh, 50 years in Loughborough and I'm 21 years here. It's, uh, I've been in the market trade, took it off my dad and his dad before him. So and have you ever known prices like this, inflation like this? Uh, du during COVID, we, we saw it then, but I mean, it's, it's not as bad now as it was then. Yeah. So we're, we're doing OK now. I think all the market, people are coming to the market, they're happy to be here. The produce is great. 
and the prices, we, we work very low on the market, so we keep the prices as low as we can. And how is it affecting the prices that you have to pay from a wholesaler? Where, where do you get your fish from and, and how has a period of high inflation affected that? Uh, Birmingham wholesale market. I mean, most of the problems are from uh, fuel and wages. They're the biggest problem we have. Uh, sort of like the, the boats all need fueling and crewing and the costs go up, so the costs are passed on to us and then we have to pass them on to the customer, obviously. Yeah, but as you say, you try to keep them oh, a, as low a little as bit can. lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what, what are people buying at the moment when prices are a little bit higher? Do they change from maybe the high-end fish that they really want to eat that maybe tastes a bit nicer to stuff that isn't maybe as tasty but is a little bit cheaper so they can still have a fish? We, it, certainly in Market Bosworth that doesn't happen. What they do do is stop going out to eat. And then you can do, like, during COVID we had a lot of safari suppers and things like that. And people love that. And it, the, the, what they save, they could afford the best produce, but they weren't paying for a service charge or going into a restaurant or anything like that. Yeah. Louis, thank you so much for speaking to us on GB News this morning. And thanks for coming away from your fish store, which has an army of customers already, even at nine o'clock on this bright, sunny Leicestershire day. Uh, nice to see. That's that's good, and we wish him we wish him luck with all of that. Like a nice bit of fish, myself. I do. I don't eat enough fish, though. Apparently, you're supposed to have at least one piece of fish a week. Actually, that's not true. I probably do reach that target, but you should probably eat more. I love mackerel, smoked mackerel. Mm. Um, I like haddock. I like, I like um, what else? I like I like mussels. I, I like... love salmon, but I've been doing a bit of research into salmon lately, and now I'm I won't be eating salmon anymore. Mm. Apparently, I had you... crab crab yesterday, which oh, was nice. Crab. Devon Crabb, mm. dressed. Here's what the Prime Minister is talking about. Here's what he's saying uh, as regards this uh, minute, tiny, teeny, weeny, weeny drop in inflation. After a tough couple of years, today's figures show that our economic plan is working and inflation continues to fall. Having been 11% when I became Prime Minister, it's now fallen to just over 3%, the lowest level in two and a half years. And we've also seen mortgage rates fall, energy bills fall, and data this week showed that wages have been rising faster than inflation for nine months in a row. Now, because of all of that, we've been able to cut people's taxes, a £900 tax cut for the average worker, and increase the state pension by £900 this month. That all shows that our plan is working and my simple message would be if we stick to that plan people can have confidence that there's a brighter future ahead. When can we expect inflation to fall to the Bank of England's target? Well inflation is expected to continue falling over the coming months but these things don't happen by accident. It's because we have a plan and that plan is working. When I became Prime Minister I set out five priorities. The first was to halve inflation. We've more than delivered on that with inflation falling from 11% when I said that down to just over 3% this week and with wages rising, energy bills falling, uh, we've been able to cut people's taxes significantly, putting more money in people's pockets, increasing the state pension and you have to stick to that plan if we want the brighter future that we all want to see and that's why our plan is so important. Is it appropriate to use the RAF to fly people to Rome? Uh, <laughs> do you believe all that? Do you believe all that he was saying there about this falling and that falling? Today, blinking, you'd miss it, uh, the fall in inflation today. Well, we'd all be complaining if it was going the other way, so, you It's know, not going any way. That's the whole point. <laughs> Why do you bit. keep sort of trying to insist that this is great news? It's not great mm, news. Still, prices are going up on this time last year. Uh, so everything is more expensive than it has ever been before. Mm. So he can talk all he wants about this is falling and that's falling and whatever. What's your view on it? Do you notice it in what you're buying at the shops and whatever? Because I certainly don't. Andrew Pierce, great value for money. He's here at <laughs> half past nine. Thank you. Uh, with Bev. What have you got on the agenda? Well, we're talking about the ramifications of last night's vote on smoking. It is landmark legislation. This will make Britain will have the toughest anti-smoking laws in the world. Yet still, Rishi Sunak couldn't deliver it with his own party. Uh, five potential... Tory leadership contenders either voted against mm. or abstained. Which is the most cynical of all of those positions, do you think? I mean, I, I personally think the Penny Morden abstention, given yeah. we know, actually, she probably agrees with this legislation, yeah. Yeah. that just smacks of ambition. Of course it does. And, and, and Pretty Patel abstained too. And, of course, they are, the point is they're saying Tory shouldn't be banning things, freedom of choice, but actually smoking is horrible. Mm. I know as I used to smoke. Oh, and, um, uh, and normally I'd be against banning, but actually this is designed to stop 
kids yeah. getting fags in the that can't be a I, I think you make a great point. What is there really to argue? Whatever your political persuasion on this, what would there be to argue well, against Jenrick this? Jenrick says Nothing. educate, yeah. don't ban, doesn't he? But well, you, know, you can't necessarily educate against addiction. I know. And it, they're also tackling vapes too, because vapes great with, with people are giving up fags and going on to vapes because they're less damaging. We don't and know. The trouble is more young people are being drawn into smoking mm. vapes, so I think that's good. We're also talking about doctors want the law brought into line in England and Northern Ireland with Wales and Scotland to ban smacking. Mm. How do you enforce it? Well, that well, was my point, actually, yeah. But look, well, they've enforced it in, in Scotland but and Wales. They? Has anyone been prosecuted? But, but the thing is, there is an awareness now that, as you go to do you think, no, can't do that, can't raise my hand, I don't think do it would have stopped my mother. The idea <laughs> that I do not think it would have stopped her. Yeah. And, I think and she would have done it with love. And it would yeah. have been with good reason, sisters, because you were a cheeky little yeah. chap, probably. And if my <laughs> sister's watching now, she'll be thinking, no, it wouldn't have stopped Mum. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit about where you were last night. I was at a very glittering, glamorous soiree. It was Liz Truss's book launch. Oh, right. Ten days to save the West. Ten she, years. Ten years to save the West. <laughs> yes, ten years. She was a sweller. Braverman was there. Uh, it was packed, uh, and she was in great form. What sweller Braverman was in Belgium? She got back in time. She's all over she, the place. She was back in time to make sure everybody knew she was not voting for the smoking ban. Oh. And then she was at the Spectator event. Oh, she was also Spectator. commenting on the Catherine yeah. Burble sing story, she which is the governor of the school. She was a busy yeah. lady yesterday. Yeah, it, we're also following up the Burble sing story. So, but, but so quite a lot of Tories there, and she was in very good form. She says the book's selling very well, and she made lots of jokes at the expense of um, Boris, Theresa May, uh, and, uh, for, and, and very grateful, she said, for her 49 days as Prime Minister. Well, there we go. And she's still speaking to me, even though I asked her when I interviewed with the Daily Mail about the rumours about her relationship with her then-Chancellor. Um, quasi quarting And she denies anything? She said we even... were just good friends. That's all right, then. That old chestnut. <laughs> okay, That's Andrew. what I say about you, Isabel. When <laughs> <laughs> you ask me, I say we're just... <laughs> unfortunately, we're just good friends. That's the whole thing. Uh, we will see you at half past nine, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, I've become a bigger friend if you won this competition. Yeah, I, well, I would take you, I promise. Um, this is your chance to win a £10,000 Greek cruise, a luxury travel bundle and a whopping £10,000 in tax-free cash, which, let's this, face it, it's pretty rare to get anything tax-free yeah, and this is our biggest <laughs> prize of the year so far. Here's how it could all be yours. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck crystal clear water that we see every morning it lifts my and the spirits sunshine. and the music the blue sky transports me to the Aegean all those sort of thing what's mm. that Greek drink what's that drink they have oh um Uzo Uzo yeah mm. Uzo Uzo Uzo's the, <laughs> the Uzo. pasta Uzo woman <laughs> Uh, there we go. Still to come. We're going to take a break and then we're going to get a live reaction uh, from the government, from um, L Laura Trott, who is a secretary uh, to the Treasury, uh, on this morning's inflation figures. So that will have you gripped <laughs> after this. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
the newspapers getting you down. My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you want, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. We should say uh, a couple of hours ago we announced the uh, monthly inflation figures uh, from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, so the, the figure that we have, 3.2 per cent, that's down from 3.4. Yeah, it is a fall, uh, but not as big as many were hoping. Let's get the thoughts of the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott. Very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've heard from the Prime Minister really and indeed the Chancellor this morning, both saying uh, this is proof that the plan is working. Uh, but it's a little bit stickier than the plan was, isn't it? It's coming down much more slowly than you would have liked. No, that's not true. I mean, compared to the forecast uh, from a little while ago, this is coming down a lot faster. But we know that uh, inflation doesn't necessarily fall in a straight line. Um, so this is very good news that it's come down today from 3.4 to 3.2 per cent. And I should say that this hasn't happened by accident. You know, when the PM took office, uh, you know, a year and a bit ago, inflation was at 11 per cent. Food inflation was at nearly 20 per cent. Uh, and thanks to the work of the government and the Bank of England, what we've work? now got what that work? down. And that is just shows what that the, work? Of uh, course it was lucky. Hang on, I'm sorry, my uh, earphones. Sorry, Laura, I'm just saying. Oh, no, it wasn't I, lucky, Eamon. That's I, not fair. It was lucky. What have you, what have you, what have was, you done, no, what no, have you no, done to bring this figure action. down? Well, concerted action, you know, we've, and don't just listen to me, Eamon, you should listen to the IMF, who praised our decisive and responsible action in bringing inflation around. You mm -hmm. should look at the OBR, who said of our most recent budget that it was mm -hmm. deflationary for this year. You know, this is something that really does require the Bank of England and the government yeah. working together. And because we've done that, because the plan is working, the economy is now turning a corner. Well, if you want to quote the IMF, uh, they've downgraded their growth forecast for the United Kingdom. Is that part of the plan? And is rising unemployment part of the plan? And is it economic inactivity part of the plan? One in five British people not contributing to the economy. High interest rates do have an impact on growth. That is why it's so important that we get inflation down and open the door for those interest rates uh, to fall. Um, we all, uh, countries pretty much across the board, have been downgraded in the G7 apart from uh, the US. Uh, and we will be the fastest growing European uh, economy next year. 
But as I said, this is all part of an overall plan, which is seeing the economy growing last year when it was predicted to be in a very, very deep recession. Uh, it's seen inflation falling uh, and we can see the economy is turning mm -hmm. a corner. Can I ask you how you voted last night um, in the smoking tobacco and vapes bill? And I ask because more than half of your colleagues voted against the Prime Minister's legacy bill and indeed a number of your colleagues in the Cabinet. It's not a given if you're sitting alongside the Prime Minister on a Tuesday morning that you are voting with the Prime Minister. Well, no, this is, a, this is a free vote, and you'll know how a free vote works. It means that it's not uh, whipped. It wasn't for the Conservatives last night. Uh, this was a so-called matter of conscience. Uh, and this has been consistent with how this has been done. Previously, uh, you may remember Tony Blair, when he had the ban on smoking indoors, it was a free vote. And indeed, in that, uh, in that vote, uh, John Prescott, who was then the Deputy Prime Minister, mm. voted against uh, Tony Blair. And, um, you know, I heard his government went on to survive for a little while. So I think this is a pretty well-established precedent for a free vote. Penny Mordaunt, though, abstained, and you'd imagine that given her moderate views, she would probably have agreed with this legislation. There's more to this than just a free vote. So cynically, you could say that she has ambitions to lead the party in the future, and all of these uh, voting, whether they abstained or voted against, is an indicator of problems. Rishi Sunak losing his authority, perhaps not being at the top of the party for much longer. Look, I fundamentally disagree with that. This was a free vote. I don't think we should read anything into it other than the fact that it was a, a free vote done on people's individual views. It's a bit of a funny concept for us because, you know, most votes are whipped on party lines, but this one absolutely wasn't. So it was up to any individual what they mm. wanted to do. Can we ask you about this um, National Conservatism conference yesterday? Um, look, there's been widespread criticism of the heavy-handedness of the mayor, and I think we can all agree that any um, encroachment on free speech has to be a bad thing. Um, but Labour have told us this morning um, that the Prime Minister has serious questions to answer about members of the Conservative Party sharing a platform with some of the controversial speakers there. Uh, there are allegations that this could be some anti-gay views, anti-abortion, uh, pro-Putin positions. Um, Suella Bravman, among those taking the stage. What would you say to Labour about that? Look, I would say as a general principle that it's really important that we uphold free speech and also that we talk to people within the parameters of legality. So where is someone who is making a legal argument that doesn't, uh, you know, is an incitement to hatred, isn't, you know, with all the other things, um, then we absolutely need to defend that. You have to be able to be on a platform generally with people that you disagree with. That is the fundamental tenet of democracy. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't say to people you can't make that argument we should defeat that argument through reason and demonstration and that is absolutely vital and one that we must not and cannot move away from okay. laura we've got to leave it there uh, we say goodbye to you and thanks for your time thank this you. morning uh, laura trott is uh, a treasury thanks, secretary Heather. thank you thank you very much um, and uh, we've just reached the the end of the show uh, yeah, and hope you've enjoyed the last three and a half hours as much as we have we will be back tomorrow morning from 6am. Yeah, but up next, we'll leave you in the capable hands of Andrew and Bev. And of course, one last look at the forecast. Have a fabulous day. See you soon. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Many of us will have a fine, bright day today with some sunshine. Still going to be pretty gusty across the east with a fair